Welcome back. Uh, Tony, would you mind calling roll again? Thank you. Jimenez? Jimenez? Morales? Here. Owen? Here. Roscoe? Here. Davis? Here. Esparza? Here. Arenas? Here. Foley? Here. Mahan? Here. Jones? Present. Ricardo. Unanimous, we're all here. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tony. We're on to item 3.7, and I believe Tony needs to read something after public comment on this. Is that right, Tony? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so this is a public hearing and approval of San Jose Muni water system water rates for 21-22. We'll go first to the public for comments. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 5140. Do you really think raising the, wa the water rates is a good idea right now? It's not. Uh, garbage fee increases, electric fee increases, water rationing. This is Chinatown, the Jack Nicholson movie all over again. It's a scam. You, got, you guys got Mulholland running this whole operation. But, you know, since it's Silicon Valley, they never talk about the corruption of anything. Everything seems to be clean and on the up and up. When once you once you start peeling the onion, it's rotten and it's it's infected. It's filthy, dirty. You guys should be ashamed of yourselves by letting these utility com companies and trash companies run roughshod over you. But you know what? Who knows what what they give you in return? I can't. I don't know. But it's almost like you guys are being paid off. Thank you. Uh, Roland? Oh, I'm sorry, forgive me. Steve, Steve Bennett? Uh, thank, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Steve Bennett. Uh, I'm kind of curious, uh, are we paying for all the flood damage that the water company caused? Uh, Anderson Dam is paid with uh, federal monies. Uh, you know, all these folks are always getting pay increases. Uh, you know, what I'd like to see as a citizen is like the five years of pay for the CEO, the last five years of pay for all the people, the last five years of all their cost to justify all this increases. This is all kind of behind the curtain. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Roland? Thank you, Mayor. Well, same comment as uh, the last you know, three or four items. Um, we can't carry on like this. I'm writing to you right now about some immediate and long-term measures we could take, but we just can't carry on with that uh, water district. We're gonna have to take the matter in our own hands and uh, address this issue once and for all. Thank you. Thank you. Let's return to council. <clears throat> And I appreciate that it's um, all laid out in staff memo, but um, Jeff would be helpful, at least for those who are watching, who may not be well informed about uh, the details and politics of water rates, um, just to help us understand. Um, well, actually, I'm sorry, at this time, Tony's supposed to be reading something. So I'm gonna stop talking now. Tony? Subsequent to ESD's supplemental memorandum dated June 11th, 2021, the city clerk's office received 11 additional potable water rate protests. Therefore, the total number of valid written protests is 151 for the proposed potable water rates. No protests have been received in response to the proposed recycled water rates. The total of all written protests during the public protest period, together with the three speakers protesting the rate changes today, represents less than 1% of all customers impacted by the change in water retail rates. Therefore, Council may consider staff's recommendation for municipal water system rate increases. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Okay, now I'll jump in. Um, Jeff or Carrie, uh, you know, my understanding is that our water retail rates are largely a function of water wholesale rates. Um, could you just give us some sense of scale and scope uh, so at least the public understands what the source of the challenge here is? Thank you, uh, Jeff Provenzano, Deputy Director for Municipal Water System. Um, it's a good question and we like to kind of highlight it um, as much as we can. 
or relatively lean program um, our, of our operating costs, about 70% of our operating cost comes from buying wholesale water. About another 5% comes from the electricity of moving water. So 75% of everything that's in our operating uh, costs that we, that we go through is it's all attributed to either wholesale water or the movement of water. Thanks, Jeff. All right, let's come back to council questions or comments or not. I, I, I guess just to be clear, let me just add, uh, Jeff, you, you, you answered very thoroughly, but in this case, we've got wholesale increases of how much is it nine point? Um, for treated water, so for, for groundwater, it's going up by about 9.2%, uh, and for treated water, it's right around 10%. Okay. Um, and for water that we, we use both supplies, but treated water, we are usually, uh, we're usually, most of the water that we use is treated water, about 10% increase in wholesale costs. All right. So roughly two thirds of our rate increases are attributable to that fact. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Councilor Sabarza. Councilmember Sparza. Oh, thank you. I uh, just wanted to follow up similar to what we had just discussed. Um, are we, how are we coordinating with Valley Water for their um, utility bill assistance program? Um, as they set it up, uh, we'll do a lot of messaging. Um, uh, to get that to our customers on how they can help uh, participate in that program. Uh, I don't believe Valley Water has it up and running yet. Uh, they're going to work through a nonprofit to do that once they have the, the rules and the application process there. We'll do what we can to, to um, let um, our customers know um, whatever resources are available to, to obtain that. And are we utilizing the, um, the rental assistance equity network to do that? Is that sort of our plan and helping to get that message out? Uh, for us, there, there are a couple uh, bills, one uh, through the federal government uh, that's uh, still in development. Um, I can bring that up. That would be, um, the, the, the term for that would be the Low Income Household Water Assistance Program. Um, where that is now is the state is in the process of setting up a program to administer those funds. Uh, they needed the state will prepare and submit uh, this uh, a plan to um, health and human services with the federal government. Uh, once that's up and running, they'll let us know um, how uh, we as a as a municipal water retailer can participate. Um, it will be on an applicant basis. We had originally thought it'd be a maybe a lump sum of money coming in that we could use um, to uh, to waive bills, but it's going to be more on a on a case by case scenario. Um, but it'll be running through us. We can help set that up for uh, those customers that are uh, eligible to apply. So, so the reason I asked that question was the leading question, <laughs> basically so that we can use our rental assistance network. We have over 70 nonprofits in the community that we work with um, to people who have relationships with community folks um, throughout the city to be able to get the word out. Um, and so I think that's something that we should leverage. Um, it's an existing network. And in particular, it would be great if they're gonna be um, sitting down with folks for different types of assistance that this get included, that we still do everything that we're gonna do, um, but this just gets added out. So as they have the menu, hopefully the what will become a menu of assistance that is really needed, um, that this, this be incorporated into that. Yes, That's it for me. Okay, thank you. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments or questions? All right, is there a motion? So moved. Oh, second. Okay, uh, motion from Vice Mayor. Uh, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye.
Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Um, item 3.8 is approval of the operating capital budgets for the city of San Jose. Uh, council member is, oh wait, let's, uh, council member Sparge, we'll come right back to you. Just go to the public. Uh, Paul Soto. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Paul Soto. Um, the, I, I like the memo that uh, Councilwoman Esparza crafted. I think that it was, it was detailed and accurate in terms of the grasp of what is necessary. A key component for me as a citizen though, what is missing from that is that we are actually looking at the symptoms of the progressive neglect of having that conversation that pretty much I've dedicated my life's work to. My mother was affected by all of those policies and I don't speak Spanish as a result of it. So something was stolen from me. Not only was it generational wealth, but it was my language and it happened in these schools. And so we have to get comfortable with these conversations because we're gonna con I'm gonna continue to press to have them. And so what, what, what I appreciate about Councilwoman Esparza is she articulated at least the symptoms. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Simon first. Yes, good evening. Thank you for taking the call. Uh, my name's Simon Purse. I am the Senior Clinical Director at Uplift Family Services, and we are a best uh, contracted provider, and we currently serve in San Jose, Overfeld, and Oak Grove High Schools. And we are very much in favor of Council Member Esparza's memo asking for support for the best infrastructure services. Adding resources and a database will help city staff so that they can be even better partners with community-based organizations like Uplift Family Services, and the sister programs that they, that they work with to support the community. By the same token, nonprofits, my teams that do the work, we often have bandwidth issues being able to handle the complex reporting requirements that are recorded. And so if uh, this, this pulls us away from important direct service and intervention, we hope that the city council will revisit the best contract amounts and that nonprofit sustainability um, is, is considered. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. All right, now uh, we'll return to Council Member Esparza. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and, and Simon, we, we did approve that in the mayor's budget message a few items ago um, uh, for best. Um, what is before us is uh, 3.8. Um, I'd like to thank Council Member Mann for including that um, in his memo um, as well. And this, um, was really sparked by um, a year of a pandemic and seeing the impacts um, uh, disproportionately affect low-income communities who are often low-income communities of color. And I'd like to thank um, Policy Link. Um, I, uh, we did some research um, with their cities and counties for a uh, fine and fee justice project. There are 10 cities and counties that they're working with across the country. Um, and uh, they have delved into some of this work and we've seen that here in, at the city. And, and by the way, I just wanna add, it's not that we haven't done anything here at the city. Um, the city of San Jose recognizing um, this is an important issue, has already implemented some fee and fine relief during the pandemic. Um, and these programs in, include suspending late fees during the pandemic for library book returns, a parking citation amnesty program, and a late payment moratorium for municipal water. But, um, and, and, and I, wanted to recognizing that there's still a lot of uncertainty left before us, um, not just with the pandemic, but with the funding and the guidance from the federal government. Um, I think that while we take this breather, it allows us to better collaborate with these other government agencies so that we can take this time internally to look at our own fines and fees, which as we've discussed many times on the dais is not, it, 
we do that to uh, encourage or discourage certain behaviors. Fees and fines are not a revenue stream for the city. And in fact, um, to highlight that, uh, I just wanted to point out one of the items that we just voted on in the budget was uh, to fund the four swim centers in the city. Um, and by funding the four swim centers in the city, looking at the fees incurred, we incurred a 15,000 revenue loss to do that for the city. So to open that up for the whole city, it only cost us $15,000 to do that. And, and that, that, that $15,000 plus there were $10,000 in, in equipment for a total of $25,000, that minimal charge makes all the world of difference in preventing low-income communities from accessing those services. So here we just opened up four swim centers at the deal of $25,000. And so my hope was just to take this breather, take this time while we reassess what our options are, what our partner government entities are doing so that we can collaborate on the impacts of fees and fines to low-income communities, one, and then on the other side, see how we can address some fees to access services, um, how we can, what, what are our options around that? And so that's, that's really what it is. And, um, and it's understanding that the American Rescue Plan is a one-time fund. Um, this just gives us some, a chance to really look at that and address that. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, move my memo and approve the uh, operating capital budgets for the city. Second. Thank you. Uh, motion second. Um, I, I have a question for staff as we think about this. I know there's a lot of different ways to approach this. Excuse me, and I'm, I'm mindful that the fundamental imperative here is to start with an equity focus about who is least able to pay and who's struggling the most. So certainly, you know, programs such as was mentioned in, in Councilmember Sparza's budget document around relieving families of fees for, for you know, child activities that you, we, won't, we want all families to have access to certainly makes sense. <clears throat> I know there's a very small percentage of homeowners that would fall in this category. Uh, and by homeowners, I'm really referring to rate payers for garbage um, and, and electric and others. But and I, and I also aware that there is some state money that will help us with electric and water, but I wonder to what extent we could identify where there's a non-payment of rates for, for example, garbage um, among that subset of, of rate paying homeowners um, that would fit, that would qualify on an income basis, whether we could essentially do two things with this money, both relieve them of that debt and help to bolster those funds in a way uh, that will reduce some of the burden citywide on rate increases, uh, because we know, I assume that some percentage of that pressure is just coming from the fact that we have people unable to pay. Um, so I asked the question, I know it's very abstract and this is a probably a a, a very um, laborious analysis to go item by item, but um, do we think there's some significant number of homeowners that would qualify on an income basis in those areas where it's a city fund that we know is, is facing shortfalls anyway, and by having some dollars help to offset that debt, we could actually relieve the burden on, any, on everyone? Not sure. Um, you know, we can investigate how we would figure out the status of a particular parcel owner. But um, one of the reasons we went, we moved the um, solid waste contracts to the property tax rules is the county has advised us that people typically pay the entirety of that bill. And there's many extra fees in that bill, so they typically don't short pay it. Um, so there might be a way, though, to refund the money or um, 
under, better understand if there's a way before we transmit it, we could delete, um, delete that from someone's bill, but we won't be able to do it fast enough this year because it's, it's quite a large file that, that gets sent over to the county for billing. But um, I don't, and Lee, maybe you have more insight than I do, but we don't know the income of certain parcel owners. Right. But and we do, we could know if they participate in other programs. Right, but perhaps we could use geography as some proxy for homeowners assuming it's an owner-occupied residential parcel, right? Yes. Okay. All right. I, think. I, I know this is a much deeper conversation offline. I'm, I'm sorry to get us distracted, but I just thought I'd raise the issue seeing if there's a way essentially to do two things, which is to relieve struggling ratepayers and um, hopefully be able to do something about the ongoing march of rates. Okay, uh, on the motion then, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Morales? Sorry, yes. Owen? Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Marinas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. All right, thanks everyone. Item 3.9 is the real estate services audit. We do have a presentation from Joe. Yes, good evening, or good evening, Joe Royce City Auditor. We do have a presentation and I think someone's bringing it up. So thank you. I am joined by Leonard Hyman and Vicki Sun from my office to present our audit of real estate services, better tools, coordination, can improve asset management and service delivery. I believe Nancy Klein and Kevin Ice from the Office of Economic Development are here as well. we'll hopefully we'll be brief. The city of San Jose owns about uh, 1,200 parcels of land along with other properties and infrastructure, including municipal facilities such as city hall, fire stations, libraries, parks and open space, revenue and generating enterprises such as the airport, and other buildings or land uh, that are leased outside entities. The Real Estate Services Division of the Office of Economic Development is responsible for a range of real estate services and activities in the city, including managing facility leases and telecom telecommunications property use agreements and property acquisitions and sales. Real estate also works with, closely with other city departments on real estate related transactions to support city pro uh, projects and initiatives. It should be noted that real estate does not manage all uh, properties in the city or le manages all leases in the city, leasing activity in the city, though they will assist other departments in those activities. The objective of this audit was to assess real estate services processes for tracking city properties and revenues, and we have four findings. The first finding is that better tools would improve coordination for real estate management. Real estate services division manages the city's properties to facilitate real estate related transactions to support city projects and generate, generate revenue, as I mentioned before. However, the work is hampered by not having a consolidated inventory of real estate assets. When property questions arise, the division often will be required to conduct extensive research on properties, reviewing old documentation, reaching out to, di to different departments to identify who's responsible for managing the property and other tasks. The city does use a third-party database of real estate assets to help in their inquiries, but it doesn't contain complete up-to-date information on the city's real estate portfolio. Other departments, including public works and the finance department maintain databases of properties as well. However, they serve different purposes and are similarly limited. And having a complete real estate asset inventory implementing asset management software can help the city better manage its properties in the future. And we have two recommendations to that effect. The second finding is that having an up-to-date inventory and better coordination can help the city maintain its vacant properties. Among the city's real estate holdings are vacant lands or buildings. However, the city does not have a current list of such properties. Having a complete listing of city-owned vacant properties and buildings can help the city identify potential opportunities for such properties to meet other city-wide goals. And it can also help real estate services coordinate and ensure maintenance issues, including weed abatement, repairs, or other problems can be addressed timely and appropriately. Our third finding is that real estate services manages various property and telecommunications leases. Real estate manages 32 property leases where the city is the landlord in property use agreements. Property leases include commercial leases that generate about $1.6 million in fiscal year 1920 and below market leases to community-based organizations that provide services that benefit residents. 
The city also manages property use agreements with private telecommunications companies, which generated about $1.4 million in fiscal year 1920. To incentivize macro cell development on city properties, real estate is working on a market rental rate analysis to determine a new fee structure for macro cell telecommunication leases. Macro cell facility is a part of a mobile network that provides coverage through a high power cell site, such as a tower or an antenna. The macro cell fee structure was last updated in 2006, and we have a recommendation that upon completion of its market rental rate analysis, real estate brings uh, a new macro cell telecom, the new uh, macro cell telecom fee schedule to council for approval. Our last finding is that the city should update the municipal code and policies around surplus land. The California Surplus Land Act imposes restrictions on how the city disposes of or transfers city owned surplus land. Surplus land is land that a local agency like San Jose decides is unnecessary for the agency's use. Council policy 7-13, which is the policy for the sale of surplus property provisions related to affordable housing, provides guidance around the identification and disposal of surplus land as outlined in the city's municipal code. And although the city's policy currently aligns with state regs, regulations around the identification and declaration of surplus land, the city will need to update the muni code and policies on transferring or the disposal of surplus land to fully comply with changes to the Surplus Land Act. And we have a recommendation on that point. So our, rec our report includes a total of six recommendations to improve real estate services processes for tracking and maintaining city properties. I'd like to thank the Office of Economic Development, the City Attorney's Office, and the other departments that we worked with that helped in the audit for their timely insight. Ask you accept the report, and I'll now turn it over to Nancy or Kevin for the city's response. Of course, we're happy to answer any questions. Good evening, Mayor and Council, Nancy Klein, Economic Development, particularly real estate tonight. I wanted to thank the auditor and his team. This was the first audit that real estate or myself have gone through in the course of uh, my career here at the city, and real estate is constantly striving for continuous improvement to keep getting better on our key results. And the spirit of constant improvement is what Joe and his team uh, helped us with. So we are very grateful for the support. And as the auditor mentioned, there are a handful of really key items, including some new technology that will really continue to help us manage our assets. And, and most importantly, to actually bridge across the departments that uh, handle real estate so that we can do that more cohesively. For a tiny bit more uh, detail, I'm gonna turn this over to Kevin Ice. Kevin, please. Thanks, Nancy. Hi, um, I'm Kevin Ice, real estate manager. I'll run through the real estate division's response to each of the six audit recommendations. All of our responses are green, uh, meaning that we will implement the recommendations and work is already underway to implement the majority of the recommendations. Uh, the first two recommendations concern the new database platform uh, that we're discussing. A request for proposals for a software platform is underway and it will be established with a comprehensive asset list. Uh, we expect to have the RF completed in quarter three, 2021, with build out occurring over the next quarter targeting completion in calendar year uh, 2021. The next recommendation is to report on the city's vacant properties annually. Uh, Real estate does an annual report to the CED committee, uh, which is next scheduled for November of this year and will include uh, information about the city's vacant properties in that report. Um, the city owns some vacant properties that are held for future development objectives, and this reporting will be an opportunity to confirm that the reasons that we're holding these properties still apply and that uh, they aren't better off being put to a different use. Recommendation four concerns coordinating with other departments to ensure property maintenance data is standardized and can be cross-referenced across departments. Real estate staff's work is done primarily through in-person collaboration uh, and this will not change going forward. However, a more comprehensive property management database will allow for more efficient management across city departments. And we're working with IT to ensure that our new platform can be set up in a way to standardize data for cross-referencing. Uh, 
Uh, the next recommendation is to update the city's macro telco uh, telecom fee schedule. We've commissioned an appraisal of macro cell tower leases throughout the city. Uh, an updated fee schedule and lease template will be brought to council in calendar year 2021. Uh, this, is, this update is an opportunity to incentivize three objectives. Uh, first, more appropriate fee schedule will assist real estate staff in securing new macro cell leases and increase revenue to the general fund. Second, a fee schedule that is calibrated to different densities throughout the city will help drive investment and better coverage for our neighborhoods. And third, uh, this update is an opportunity to build into the rates schedule incentives for digital inclusion objectives. And the last recommendation is to update council policy 713, uh, which governs surplus sales uh, to make it consistent with state law. Uh, all surplus activities conducted by real estate are consistent with state surplus law. There are exceptions in council policy 713 that are inconsistent with state law, but staff does not follow those inconsistent elements. And instead we follow state law. Uh, so we'll work with the city attorney's office to update the policy 713 and we plan plan to bring that to council in calendar year 2021. So I'd like to thank Joe and the audit team for the work that they did to understand the real estate division. Uh, the recommendations in this report reflect diligent work on their behalf uh, to add value to our work processes. Thank you. And with that, we're available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Nancy, and thanks, Joe. Let's go to the public first. Uh, the person with the phone number 5140. Yes, uh, these fines that you guys are loving are no big deal. I've got one you guys can uh, take off the books right away if you, you know, like, like to sit down and talk about it. Uh, you know, these fines, if it's not about the money, then why are you charging for it? If it's not for the revenue stream, why are you charging for it? And by the way, the courts are closed. I, I was cited in 2020, and, and I've been given at least two or three notices not to show up in, now until 2022. So you guys want to keep handing out these citations and fining people for traffic and, and infractions and misdemeanors? All you're doing is keeping a bunch of money on the books and backing up the courts. Your police department should be ashamed of themselves as they make half a million dollars a year, a lot of them, and they're, they think that get, giving someone a citation for $1,260 is no big deal. So I'll tell you what. Thank you. Paul Soto? Uh, Paul Soto, that report is 100% unacceptable. I don't believe a word of it. It's disingenuous, irresponsible. The city doesn't have an inventory of its assets, real estate assets. I don't believe that for a second. I bet you Gary Dillabo, John Arriaga, uh, and, uh, and uh, Eric Hayden know precisely where those properties are at, okay? So that's one piece. The other piece is these maps. Okay, I'm, real, I'm feeling like really disrespected because you're putting these maps and compare that map to the map of the property based improvement map. Compare those two maps side by side. And every single person in that department that produced this report should be ashamed of themselves. As a citizen, I expect responsible fiduciary accountability. And I want it. Okay, coming back to council. Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Joe, and your team for this report, and uh, and Nancy and Kevin for your presentation. I I just want to ask, and this is no disrespect to to Nancy and Kevin and your team. We don't have a great track record with software implementations in our city, and so I want to know who is going to own the software implementation, and it. It's two, there's two pieces to it. There's the workflow piece and there's the, the actual software piece. So who, who, who's gonna own that? Kevin, you wanna go ahead. The good news is council member, this is very relatively simple technology. Yeah, uh, so- <laughs> I know we're not uh, talking about Amanda here. Like I get that, <laughs> right? But I just wanna, I have to ask the question. 
Yeah, uh, we're, we're pretty excited about it. We, we live in Excel, Excel spreadsheets right now. And as Joe mentioned, a uh, third party database that pulls from public record. Uh, so we have a good opportunity to really lift up our work uh, through a better database. Uh, so real estate is going to drive the build out of an accurate data set into the new platform, but we are working with uh, purchasing and IT to make sure that the uh, nuts and bolts of the software are implemented correctly. And I saw Rob raise his hand. Can't hear you, Rob. Uh, Rob, you're, uh, sorry, I pressed uh, the wrong button there. Um, Council, uh, Council member uh, Rob Lloyd, CIO for the city of San Jose. We've actually worked with uh, Nancy and with Luz and talked about the project manager we'll assign to this to make sure that the requirements are clear and we're focusing on process improvements that they'll require. Uh, and then there is a procurement piece that will go along with this, um, but we're going to meet as many needs as we can with these investments, um, but with a specific focus on the items that Joe identified. But Nancy and her team have been advocating this for a number of years. We also have the GASB rule change around leases. And so there's a couple of things that we're going to have to meet at the same time. Thank you. And what's the, the budget impact of this software procurement and implementation? Sounds like we're using in-house project management. That's good. Yeah, so we budgeted $105,000 for the build out. Okay, thank you. And then um, will the progress on the implementation go to the Smart Cities Committee in the fourth quarter of 2021, just to keep everybody updated? We certainly can do that. Okay, I'm gonna make that part of my motion and accepting the report. Oh, sorry, yeah. Member, if I can ask that we move that to uh, the January 2022, the, the work plan we have defined, but that would give us enough time to actually see the results and then report. Okay. That sounds good. I'll, I'll make that my motion. I have a couple of other questions. Um, there was one sentence in the response that gave me pause and Nancy's smiling because I bet she knows what it is. Real estate cannot assure participation of these other departments. Uh, that means I would like to know, so the other departments that were listed were public works, PRNS, uh, transportation, housing department, and of course the assistance of IT, which I think we can be assured of that since we just were. So my question here is for Dave, and I think he anticipated that, who will own this in the city manager's office to ensure the participation of all the departments that need to be uh, included so that this, this database actually becomes a centralized database? Yeah, I hadn't, uh, I guess I hadn't picked up on that. And I, didn't, and I, I don't know, Nancy, if there's some sort of reluctance here on the departments, but uh, I don't foresee any issues uh, <laughs> in terms of, um, you know, adopting the format and, and uh, participating. So is there something I'm missing, Nancy? Thank you very much, council member and, and Dave. Um, as, as the city auditor mentioned, each department has their own system. So what we've been working with Rob on is to implement this technology, which isn't completed yet in procurement, and we have also simultaneously been talking to the departments and to Rob so that while we'll get the, the implementation first, the other departments will be over our shoulder in what the um, infrastructure is, is chosen and how it works with assistance for Rob about how it can uh, cross over to work with those other departments. And the intended outcomes are to have a comprehensive database and then the opportunity to look even more tightly as, as Public Works already does a great job, but at, at the budgeting for maintenance on the, on the uh, buildings and the lands along with DOT um, as well as housing. So, so those are, are, we're natural allies. We, we are gonna have a stepped solution. And the only thing I would add to, to what Nancy uh, described is some departments actually have some pretty mature practices. Um, and uh, so like PropWorks and, and the way we manage leases and revenue at airports. Uh, and, and so we do have to go through those things with departments to not put them on one system, but cause them some kind of um, a failure or, or even uh, can make them less efficient and less effective. So we are gonna have to work through that. Council member, just to be honest with you, yep. we, we still need to go through the requirements piece to make sure that everyone 
has and will get what they're uh, they're going to need. Yep. Thanks. So, Dave, the, hence my question: Who in the city manager's office is going to own this, since it will require a lot of cross departmental uh, Roseland. coordination? Roseland. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. I was actually going to jump in, Council Member, because the, the governance structure is somewhat similar to development services, where we have three different departments involved um, in the technology and in the software. So I, I see this as something very similar. Okay. So you've been here before. I have indeed. And you know what the pain points are. Definitely. <laughs> okay. So um, in addition, so I'll make the motion to accept the report and refer this to um, this item to Smart Cities Committee in January of 2022. And I know you guys probably just finished your work plan, but I'm going to add one thing to it. And then I just want to add on, since the target date for completion in bringing the comprehensive system together is in quarter four of 2022, that I want this to be owned by the Smart City Committee for periodic updates as well to ensure that the coordination across departments does happen and we do end up with a comprehensive system. So that's Second. My Thank Second. you. All right, motion from Councilmember Davis and a second. Um, thank you, Councilmember, for your questions. You anticipate some of mine as well. I, I, I had a question. Um, Nancy, I guess about, you know, our last, and Kevin, you know, when we last took a really deep dive on our real estate assets, I think, you know, I know we last update was in 2015, but I think it was really in 2009, 2010, and 11, uh, when we were basically fire selling developable sites to fill the gigantic hole in our, in our budget. And the conclusion I came to after looking at what we thought were thousands of parcels was the overwhelming majority of them are absolutely worthless and not developable. And we can never actually have human beings living on them, working in on them or recreating on them. Uh, there'll be you know some remnant parcel in a street or adjacent to railroads tracks or something like that, uh, that that's just totally undevelopable. It, is, do you have any sense of what that fraction of the 1250 is? There's probably 25 to 30 sites, Kevin, is that fair? There's, it's a small number of sites, Mayor, with a couple of big ones like you're speaking about the, the buffer land on 237, Singleton landfill. There, there are, there are uh, a handful uh, of really, um, we're gonna find a great use for those. Yeah. Some of them are, are the small remnants from right of way which, which absolutely those, when they was combined with a project that's upcoming, there's a, there's an opportunity to earn revenues and uh, facilitate projects. But um, the, the bulk of our holdings are um, not uh, prime pieces of real estate. And then I'm speaking about those remnant parcels. Of course, there's everything that parks uses or housing uses, which are for the open space parks or um, community centers. And those, yeah, uh, that's the goal and or in the future, council may decide to change the use, but. Right, yeah, I appreciate that. So we're not gonna go, so excluding parks and all the other uses that we currently have that are active. If we just talked about inactive parcels um, or perhaps underutilized parcels, you're talking about maybe three dozen, something like that. Kevin, would you agree? I believe that's around that number from there. Yeah, that sounds about right. And can, can we say, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here about our efforts in the past to try to identify Caltrans sites for emergency housing communities, for example. Uh, can we say that we've fully combed that group of three dozen or so for opportunities for housing are unhoused? Yes. Okay, so we know that we've at least exhausted that. Okay, thank you. All right, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Owen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Sparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye.
All right, uh, item uh, 3.10, and thank you, Joe. Thanks, everybody. Uh, item 3.10, uh, happily, is the approval of terms of agreement with Air National Union Operating Engineers, uh, local uh, number three, for a term uh, through. And Mayor, I apologize for the interruption, but I'm oh. going to recuse myself. Thank you for doing so, Councilmember sure. Reynolds. My apologies for not uh, raising that sooner. Uh, that's this is through 2024. So, uh, OE three contract through 2024. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mary Blanco uh, and uh, all the members of the OE three who have been uh, working uh, through the pandemic uh, out in in the city, throughout the city, um, while many of us have been staying at home and I'm grateful for their service. And I'm also grateful for the collaboration um, in coming to an agreement, which I think is fair for everyone. Uh, and I really wanna thank our negotiating team uh, led by uh, Jennifer and Elsa. We will go first to the public, Mr. Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto, I would uh, um, agree that the unions are deserving of whatever it is that they may ask of the city, considering they responded to whatever the city asked of them. And so with that said, um, instead of new homes, they erect tombstones, casting their shadow along the river, building your towers, demonstrating your power in whose shadow the homeless shiver. So instead of new homes, you're erecting the tombstones, those buildings, those are on high rises, those are tombstones. So you can almost liken people that participate in the trades as grave diggers because the decimation and population uh, gentrification that is going to result directly from that, they are participating in it. Thank you, Soto. Returning to the council. Uh, Dave? Yeah, I just wanted to also thank the uh, OE3 for working with us and coming to this agreement. Um, and in particular, the OE3 uh, negotiating team, uh, Mary Blanco, Larry Brown, uh, Paul Prange, uh, Brett Benitez, and Daniel Foster. I can tell you firsthand, um, you know, being on a negotiating team is pretty much thankless work. Um, so I did want to thank them. And then, of course, our OE, uh, OER team, Elsa and Julianne. So just thank you to everyone for uh, coming together pretty quickly and, and getting this done. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, Meshin, but Elsa and Julianne, uh, really important, their, their hard work as well. Okay, uh, is there a motion? Move approval. Move approval. Second. All right. Uh, I'm not sure who got the motion, but we're going to vote anyway. I have fully uh, motioned and as far as a second and Dennis? Yes. Alice? Yes. Owen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, item 3.11 is the Office of Immigrant Affairs Activities and Welcoming San Jose Plan report. Um, I believe Soma is here. Uh, there is, is there a presentation, Soma? Yes, and hopefully we can keep it to 10 minutes. Okay. So, oh, there's Chris, great. Okay, good. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council. Uh, Sulma Maciel here, Director of the Office of Racial Equity. As noted in the memo, the Immigrant Affairs Team and the Racial Equity Team are now under the auspices of the newly created Office of Racial Equity. And I'm joined today by our new Immigrant Affairs Manager, Chris Cambesis, and you're gonna hear from him later, who brings a wealth of experience working on immigrant and refugee policy and programs at a global level, national and local level, and will help implement, track and evaluate the strategies delineated in the proposed welcoming San Jose plan. I'm also happy to report that we recently hired a manager to oversee the racial equity work. Andrea Truong will help embed a racial equity practice within the city of San Jose that will help improve our internal policies, programs, and decision-making. I'm excited to lead these two teams in carry out, carrying out ambitious work plans. 
And while they're distinct bodies of work, we recognize that there are points of intersection and we will continue to work closely to create a San Jose that works for everyone. Next. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to dive into the details of the memorandum and the attached plan, but I would like to note that the memo covers these four sections. So it provides a look back and highlights some accomplishments. It describes the challenges as well as the opportunities. It describes the approach that we took to develop the Welcoming San Jose plan with community partners. And it also includes the in the attachment, the Welcoming San Jose Plan 2.0, which outlines the specific goals and strategies that, that emerged out of those community meetings. Next. So for just a little bit of background for um, regarding the what was originally established as the Office of Immigrant Affairs in 2015. Uh, was created to help build a welcoming city for the nearly 40% of our city residents who were born in another country. What we know is that many more San Jose residents have Im immigrant relatives and family members with approximately 60% of children having at least one immigrant parent. As such, the vision and mission statements represent our aspirations where immigrants and refugees are engaged, respected, and have opportunities to reach their fullest potential. But I'd like to acknowledge that we're working, while we're working hard to create a city where immigrants feel a sense of belonging, we must not forget that Black, Indigenous, Chicanos also desire to feel welcomed and that immigrant justice and racial justice are intertwined. I also wanna clarify that the role of the immigrant affairs team is not to be direct service providers. We have an excellent community partners who deliver needed services so our role is to convene, to educate, to advocate, to coordinate among city departments, to collaborate across multiple jurisdictions, to leverage resources, and to be a bridge between the immigrant community and the city. Next. So in the accomplishment section of the memo, you'll find details about the progress made, um, important collaborations with community partners, as well as deliverables. So um, some examples are, you know, we've supported the naturalization efforts through co-sponsoring citizenship workshops, which served almost 2,100 immigrant participants that resulted in 950 naturalization applications com completed. We operationalized the city's first ever language access policy with citywide vendor contracts available to all city departments and provided language access training for over a thousand city staff. We coordinated with city legislative team to advocate for state and federal legislation to support the immigrant community through 15 support letters, as well as litigation opposing the rescission of DACA, adding a citizenship question to the census and public comments on public charge rule change and the Florida settlement agreement. We co-hosted skilled refugee and immigrant convenings the ref uh, with the Refugee and Immigrant Forum of Santa Clara County and participated in four skilled refugee and immigrant job fairs and together with 81 employers and 468 skilled refugees and immigrants. Those are just some of the highlights and many more delineated in the, in the memo. Next. So I won't spend too much time on the challenges, but we know what those challenges were. And um, in the previous federal administration, uh, we really were in reaction mode for most of those four years. Um, that really, uh, we had to pivot, we had to be nimble, we had to um, move away from some of the things that we were doing to make sure that we were um, empowering and, and protecting community. And then we were hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. So collaborative, some of the opportunities though, um, were that the Rapid Response Network was created in support of um, com the undocumented community and it serves now as a safety net for the community. We also participated in the census count. We, um, are, we led the census immigrant subcommittee to ensure that the city, county, and community partners were reaching hard to count communities in a culturally and logistic, linguistically responsive manner. Um, the team coordinated the city's initial training to 56 city employees through the Government Alliance for Race and Equity. And lastly, the immigrant affairs team was deployed to the EOC last year, which resulted in numerous accomplishments and deliverables as outlined in the memo. Next. In 2019, we conducted a two-pronged approach to inform 
the development of the Welcoming San Jose plan. Uh, the first one was that we had an audit by the Welcoming America, which is a national organization that provides technical assistance to local governments, aiming to create a better environment for immigrants. The audit was funded by the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. The second piece that helped inform the Welcoming San Jose plan was a community engagement process. And as the first one, we really used a community-driven process to inform the strategies that ultimately ended up in the plan. Next. So in April of 2019, the Welcoming America audit team reviewed documents and interviewed 36 individuals, including community partners and city staff, and measured the city's work against the Welcoming America national criteria. In response to their audit report, the immigrant affairs team will take action on the recommended items listed here. So for example, we've done some preliminary work on the evaluation plan in anticipation of acceptance of the Welcoming San Jose plan. And the evaluation will include performance measures of the strategies in the plan and around the four pillars. Next. And just quickly, the community engagement process, as I mentioned earlier, it started in 2019. Um, we used a collaborative approach um, that would help, that would create a plan to serve the San Jose's diverse immigrant population by identifying community partners to serve in the working group for a six month planning process. The 11 primary working group members were from various sectors, city and county government, education, basic need providers, legal providers, and nonprofits focused on immigrant well being. Additionally, we had 134 unique voices from 47 community groups that were engaged, seven focus groups with the following populations like Vietnamese, Arab Muslim, youth, educators, Latino Spanish speaking adults, and youth, um, African immigrants, Eritrean and underserved neighborhoods. And we are deeply grateful for their time, effort and contributions and commitment to craft a plan that we can all be proud of. Next. So we presented to the Neighborhood Services and Education Committee last month. And so the following um, list is a reflection of what's, what's in the replacement memorandum um, and the Welcoming San Jose plan. So I just wanted to walk through you know, some of the um, pieces that are in here. Um, we, are trying, we tried to address all of them in the replacement memorandum as well as making, made the changes in the Welcoming San Jose plan. Um, one of the very first directives was to coordinate the um, further engagement with council offices. And so we added a piece of that into the Welcoming San Jose plan under the leadership and communications pillar. Um, and so you will find that we will ensure a more proper communication with all city council offices, especially those who have um, higher numbers of immigrants within their community. The second was to refrain from and discontinue the use of the term Latinx until it can be defined with further analysis. Uh, we intend to partner with educational institutions and community partners to host a community forum to learn more about the evolution of terms and identities and facilitate a dialogue about the term that ought to be used in San Jose. The third piece is references the um, addressing anti-blackness and it, it, the Neighborhood Services Education Committee requested that we change that reference and remove anti-Blackness in the Welcoming San Jose plan and replace it with anti-hate and anti-violence. So I, we believe that, you know, I, I, I want to say and I want to clarify that addressing anti-Blackness in the immigrant community was added by community organizations last fall of 2020 after heightened awareness about the need to surface the anti-Blackness sentiment that exists. So we received a couple of memos, as you saw, there were two memos that were issued related to this. And so fulfilling the recommendations in council member Esparza's memo will be important and a critical step towards addressing this issue. So thank you, council member Esparza. I also appreciate council member Carrasco's recently issued memo that explicitly recommends that the Welcoming San Jose Plan maintain the anti-Blackness language. So in this space, the role of the Office of Racial Equity will be to convene organizations who have the expertise and experience to facilitate these delicate conversations about identity. Then the fourth piece was to address human trafficking, sex trafficking, and domestic violence. And there exists, especially because we understand that there exists a high propensity of abuse on immigrant and refugee communities. And while we have some bandwidth limitations, 
we can commit to learn more by joining county task force and coalitions, find the points of intersection and determine how and who the city can support or mitigate the problems or provide greater access to resources. And the fifth point uh, around racial equity action plans, uh, this has already been incorporated into the work plan of the Office of Racial Equity and it's identified in um, the MBA number 22 on the Office of Racial Equity. And by the way, I'm hiring a senior executive analyst and it's an open recruitment. And number six, uh, we will, we've committed to provide the city council an update on the evaluation plan in the fall, and we'll make sure to incorporate updates on other directives that result from today's meeting. So I will now pass it on to Chris Cambises, the Immigrant Affairs Manager. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Christopher Cambises, and I am the new Immigrant Affairs Manager with the Office of Racial Equity. Uh, and uh, my role now is to walk you through very quickly uh, through the Welcoming San Jose Plan 2.0 and the pillars that comprise the plan. So the Welcoming San Jose Plan is organized around 21 strategies across these four pillars that you see before you, leadership and communications, access and engagement, education, economic opportunity, and safe communities. Let's move this. There we go. So the first one, leadership and communications, it's focused around establishing equitable systems and policies and practices throughout the city that create a welcoming and inclusive environment that allows immigrants, residents of color, and all people of San Jose to thrive. So it has examples some of the strategies that, are, that form part of this. So increasing uh, immigrant friendly policies and practices uh, and advocating for immigrant friendly legislation will be uh, important moving forward, as well as uh, developing and honing uh, coordination between the city and the county, as well as coordination of city council offices to ensure that we have, uh, we have a systematic uh, method of dispersing critical information, uh, providing updates on policies, sharing resources, and understanding the various needs that exist uh, in our community. Uh, the second pillar is around access and engagement, and the focus here is improving immigrant access to city information and services and augmenting immigrant participation in civic life. Uh, an example of some of the strategies that uh, were developed around this particular pillar uh, or, you know, impl continued implementation of the citywide language access uh, implementation plan, partnering with uh, English learner civics curriculum, and continuing to promote and support naturalization and voter registration uh, workshops, as well as partnering with smaller or newer immigrant and refugee groups, particularly uh, with uh, communities that are often underserved and under-resourced in these particular areas. The third pillar is education and economic opportunity. The focus here is advancing education and economic opportunities among immigrants and refugees through job skills training, strengthening career pathways, promotion of entrepreneurship, small business retention and growth, and financial literacy. Uh, so naturally, as we emerge from the pandemic and we, look, and we place our focus on an equitable recovery that incorporates all uh, members of our community, uh, we're certainly looking at areas such as convening partners to expand job training towards middle skill, uh, middle skills jobs, as well as creating career pathways for foreign trained professionals, um, supporting immigrant entrepreneurship and financial literacy, and increasing participation in uh, English language courses as well. Uh, and the fourth pillar is around safe communities, and the focus here is on fostering trust and communication between law enforcement local governments, immigrants, and the community as large, at large. Um, so we're going to continue to support the rapid response network. Uh, we, very, we believe very, very strongly uh, in continuing to invest and support the work of the network, yeah, you know, even though we are moving on uh, to a, into an administration that has various different policies around. Uh, this work. Uh, we, we still believe very strongly in the importance of the work of the Rapid Response Network, um, as well as in continuing to engage in additional work uh, we, around emergency management and emergency services to ensure that linguistically and culturally appropriate, uh, culturally responsive emergency planning incorporates all members of our, of our community and all the various challenges that they may face in an in emergency setting. Um, so that's a quick rundown through the uh, through the four pillars and an example of a few of some of some of the strategies that are within the 
uh, those pillars. Um, you know, additional details, of course, are in the plan uh, for your review. And now I will turn it back over to Suma. Thank you, Chris. So just a big thank you. We couldn't have developed this plan without the insights of our cherished community partners, and we are incredibly grateful for their commitment and servant leadership. I also want to thank my colleagues in the city organization who have been wonderful collaborators across multiple departments. And finally, I want to extend my immense gratitude to the Immigrant Affairs team, Stephanie Jane and Sabrina Parra Garcia for their hard work and authentic leadership. Next. We cannot do welcoming work within the immigrant community without addressing systemic racism. And though we did not call it racial equity work in 2015, that is what we are doing. And embedding the work of the immigrant affairs team into the newly created Office of Racial Equity simply makes sense. Uh, so, and finally, happy Immigrant Heritage Month, happy Pride Month, happy Juneteenth, happy World Refugee Day on Sunday. Um, and that concludes our presentation. We're happy to take questions. Thank you, Soma, and thank you for your leadership um, as the uh, pioneering director of this effort. Uh, thank you very much for all you've done. We have several members of the community who'd like to speak, um, beginning with Anikawada. Thank you, Mary Ricardo and City Council. My name is Nick Kawada, and I am the Policy Director for Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. I come to you today in partnership with REAL, the Race Equity Action Leadership Coalition, who's concerned with the language used at the May 20th Neighborhood Services Committee where the plan was reviewed. We feel strongly that the Welcoming San Jose plan should use inclusive language and maintain its use of Latinx alongside Latino and Latina. In addition, references of BIPOC and anti-Blackness should remain to reflect the urgency and justice felt by African ancestry communities to this day. We appreciate Council Member Esparza's memo urging for continued dialogue on the issue of terminology instead of its outright prohibition and ask that our coalition be involved to provide resources and support along the side, alongside the Office of Race and Equity. As a cisgendered heterosexual male, I, I know the importance of, of centering trans and LGBTQ communities in today's environment and encourage this city council to do the same. Please reverse the motion passed on May 20th and restore the inclusive language in not only the Welcoming San Jose plan, but broadly across all city processes and procedures. Please do the right thing and center equity in your work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul? Uh, yes, Paul Soto. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Sulma on behalf of my ancestors that experienced the deprivation of their humanity under this system that built your office. So I'd like to thank you for that because I think that you are doing an excellent job at what you are doing. We're up against literally centuries of racism. So thank you. I like the way that this, the speaking of emphasis on language, thank you for affirming that language of ancestry into that it is to be affirmed. It brings dignity and a sense of identity to a people. This city and its policies and support of white supremacy violently attacked and shamed my mother for such and stole from me my birthright to speak Spanish, creating in me an existential challenge that I contend with to this very day. Thank you, Marcos. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Marcos Pizarro. I'm the Associate Dean for the College of Ed and a Professor of Chicanic Studies at San Jose State. I appreciate the hard work and thoughtfulness that's gone into the Welcome SJ plan. And understand that some council members have concerns over the use of Latinx, which is what I want to address. They raise concerns related to being too academic and, and other concerns. Um, but at SJSU and our new Chicanx Latinx Student Success Center, we found families excited and committed to the intentional ways in which we create space for trans and gender nonconforming folks to be seen and acknowledged. We found them to be receptive to centering language that's inclusive and that does not marginalize any members of our community. Additionally, we know that many of the immigrants that come to us from Mexico and Central America come out of fear for their lives related to their gender identities. And the Welcome SJ plan should let them know that we're striving to create a city in which they are seen, welcomed, and acknowledged for their important contributions to our community. And I know that they're legitimate concerns, but these can be addressed. Please keep the language of Latinx and please keep anti-Blackness in the language as well. Thank you. Uh, Blair? Hi, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman. Um, I've spent, you know, the past few months uh, 
uh, talking about uh, you know the issues of Zoom and uh, the fact that they're charging between city government of San Jose and Zoom, it's what three hundred dollars an hour for language interpretation. To me, that really offers the idea that something is still wrong and that we're still considering the importance of uh, English only ideas from the mid 1980s that really swept this country and we have not gotten out of that since. It's very sad because uh, you know what what this item was offering and that I think we've all been working on for the past you know year is is language and interpretation and and the fact that you know as community to speak one's own language and, and to engage with city government speaking one's own language, I think that can be ways to develop harmony and, and a more functioning, better city. And that that is a step for people to understand and work towards, and we're trying to work towards that. And good luck in our efforts to do that. I don't think Zoom should be charging $300, you know, for the exclusive rights of language interpretation. Language should be free, it should be open. It should be an open process we're trying to learn. You guys are doing some incredible work here. Thank you for it. Um, yeah, I have a lot to learn myself and I, I, I'm, I'm hoping to learn what can be a real multicultural. Thank you. Uh, question number 5140. You know, I, I've heard every holiday and uh, identity day I could ever imagine, except for the feast, the, uh, the feast of the Sacred Heart. This happened that has happened this month. June is the official feast of the Sacred Heart. With many people in uh, this community as Roman Catholics, but you guys seem to overlook the Roman Catholic holidays, and a lot of you on the city council are probably wayward uh, Roman Catholics, probably self-hating Catholics. Uh, I, I can tell by the vernacular. I can tell by how the uh, there isn't any support or promotion of any Catholic holidays or festivals or even Catholic people like Italians. I mean, uh, you guys seem to overlook those. Sam's a self-hating Italian. I can tell you, uh, it's uh, really terrible how you you overlook. Thank you, Luna. Okay, sorry, this is, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good evening. My name is Mayra Pelagio and I work with Latinos United for Any America. And I feel that it is important to utilize inclusive language and call out racism by utilizing gender neutral terminology and terms that address anti-blackness. I know that Suma and her team have been working hard to ensure that everyone feels welcome in the city, starting with the city documents. And I want to express gratitude for their work on finding common ground and utilizing the word or phrase Latino, Latina, Latinx, when referring to the community that identify with these terms. I'd like to show support for including language of solidarity within the Black, Indigenous, and people of color, which includes the immigrant communities in San Jose. And in regards to City Council members' Esparza's memo, I really appreciate that it addresses anti-Blackness, and I know that community conversations are critical. I am looking forward to seeing a specific work plan and timeline for these conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Ray, welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Reverend Ray Pact, and also with the Silicon Valley Faith Leaders Consortium and 100 plus faith leaders I speak. Um, the use of words, because word matters, like anti-Black, BIPOC, and other inclusionary language defines what it means to be anti-racist. Anything else contextually is racist. Um, in the May 20 meeting of the Neighborhood and Service Education, people can watch. Uh, watch what happened after the presentation at around 52 minutes. It is mo in this most precipice moment, considering what we've learned, pain we've endured, five council people unanimously voted to remove language, anti-Black and other inclusionary language. Uh, this move of the elect reeks of historical erasure. Uh, tonight, you have the opportunity to listen and make a difference. We, the clergy, have supported a moral narrative that supports how we should move in inclusionary name, uh, language uh, that represents anti-racist rhetoric. So what we do today echoes as in the movie, uh, what we do in eternity. So we hope that the continued memos go forth and we continue to make the necessary changes to be an anti-racist San Jose. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, Mimi? 
Hi, good evening, everyone. I wanted to call in support of the work plan for the Office of Immigrant Affairs. The organization and the group that I belong to, our, group, our name is Business Circle Latinx. We identify as Latinx. Uh, it is gender inclusive. We are 50% female led and we are, we're tired of the good old Batos Club with everything with an O at the end. Latinx uh, is inclusive. Uh, I support and I'm in solidarity with the Council of Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits calling for the May 20th um, exclusion uh, to, of, of the term Latinx to be rescinded. Uh, I wanna thank everyone uh, for having the conversation and I would encourage us to continue the conversation about what we wanna be called. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Bruce. Good evening, Mayor Licardo and San Jose City Council. This is Jeremy Barus. I'm here as Deputy Director of Advocacy and Civic Engagement with Community Health Partnership. Uh, we're in um, support of the welcoming plan uh, and also um, in its priority strategies that will direct the work of the Immigrant Affairs Program under the Office of Racial Equity and will help shape a more welcoming and inclusive city for years to come. We all know immigrants contribute to the civic vibrancy, uh, vibrancy of San Jose uh, and uh, uh, it will establish a process for possible future policies that will create real opportunities for immigrants to thrive in San Jose. We ask that you include as much inclusive language possible so that all communities are recognized and that we all have an opportunity to thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Pancho Guevara, welcome Pancho. Thank you, Mayor Licardo and members of the council. My name is Poncho Gavada. I'm the executive director of Sacred Heart Community Service. And I'm um, proud to actually support um, a very thoughtful and inclusive plan that was created, the welcoming San Jose plans that have been uh, developed. And this being this being the follow-up plan to one of the, among the originals really is a thoughtful way of looking at the entire city and the infrastructure that's really developed to try to make sure that we're actually reaching immigrant communities, providing resources and prioritizing some key recommendations, including leadership and communications, access engagement, education and opportunity and safe communities. I wanna highlight the, the nature of the work that you're considering and the language that's really, really important. You've already heard other, other participants um, in this conversation bring up the need for inclusive language. And that means uh, having the city leadership uh, to really look at, at gender, uh, inclusive language, especially to uh, the Latinx community. So including that language and being able to speak to anti-blackness in our communities is a really important thing to include in the plan. And we hope that that is restored. Thank you. Thank you. Darcy Green. Hi, Darcy Green, Executive Director of the Latinas Contra Cancer. We serve the Latinx community around issues of cancer and health. We are here to support the document and also to um, ask that the word Latinx be restored into the document. As an organization that works in the health space, we understand how critically important it is to use inclusive language when referring to our community. We hope to be able to see in this document the word Latino, Latina, and Latinx. We also support the uh, restoration of the term anti-Black um, and the word and term BIPOC. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, returning to council. Any members of the council like to speak? If not, I'll, I'll jump in while folks are thinking about it. Um, okay, um, well, while folks are thinking about it, um, I'll just say first, thank you to all the members of the community who've been participating with us and have been uh, helping us find our way. And I'm, I'm not gonna comment on the issue of terminology beyond saying uh, uh, I'm a big believer in listening to communities, particularly communities that are being described and using language that's respectful to those uh, who are being described by whatever that language is. And uh, I think we all need to acknowledge we're in a very diverse community and um, there's no monolithic Latinx, Latino or Latina community. Uh, there's a very diverse set of views within every community. And we have to be, I, I think, understanding um, that uh, I think some of us with benevolent intentions, benevolent intentions uh, may make misstep, missteps. And I hope that uh, we're all understanding one another and we continue to listen. I, I really appreciate the report uh, that you provided. Uh, 
Soma and, and that you and your team did. And you know, I, I'd much rather focus really on the impact we're able to have on improving the quality of, of life for members in our community who are struggling right now. Um, having dealt with four years of what we de just dealt with and uh, many of them just in fear of their lives and still really much, very much in fear uh, of deportation and, and other related concerns. And I thought what was most, I mean, there are a lot of good things I think the office is already doing around language access training, around city leadership academies, it's really positive. But I think about the one thing that we can do that, have, that would have the biggest impact on raising the standard of living for families that are struggling in our community um, and helping them improve their quality of life. I think about the citizenship efforts uh, and before that, and I guess now resuming, I guess with recent court decisions, also efforts to get folks qualified under DACA. And I saw that there was some data there about the work done in 2018, 19, around the number of applications. Do we, it was 950 ap applications, which I know saved them a lot of resources, which is great. And hopefully many of those individuals became citizens and then were obviously able to uh, earn incomes and, and do other things that were, would help their families and help them uh, better survive and thrive here. And the question I have is first around the, the applications. Do we have any sense about how many of those applications resulted successfully in citizenship? I don't have that number, but that is exactly what we want to include in the future evaluation plan is to actually get the numbers that went through and how many actually celebrated in this naturalization ceremonies. Um, so we don't have that yet, but Thank you. the plan is to collect that from our partners. I appreciate that intention. That's great. Um, and then I assume things were a lot more challenging in 2020 like they were for everyone. I didn't see data for 2020. Did, were we able to engage at all or was everybody off working in emergency operations and unable to, to do some of this As work? A, that's a great question. As a team, we did not participate in citizenship workshops. And I understand that our legal service providers did some and they had um, very limited capacity to do that because they had to divert their attention to to other legal matters. Uh, but it was also really difficult to get people on Zoom um, and go through the application process. But they had all of last year to figure it out. And the good news is that uh, the legal service providers recently had a virtual mega citizenship workshop and over 2,000 people registered. Right. And nearly 800 people were given appointments and that was just last month. So um, our providers have done a wonderful job in being able to pivot um, through technology, but it took the community a while to get used to and trust that these legal providers really were gonna be there in service of you know, what they needed to do. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I just think about the opportunity now with the new administration. I mean, we'd formed this office and I think within a year, year and a half, we were playing defense and, and, and doing everything we could to address the fear, obviously with organizations like Siren and others taking the lead, but we were supporting them in various ways. And now we have the opportunity to really play offense, it seems to me, and really hopefully get some traction on the challenge that thousands of our families are facing. And I just wonder, do we have a goal in mind for 2021 about you know, how many folks are we gonna be able to enable to apply for citizenship? How many do we think we can help make citizens? That is a goal that we hope to establish. That, that, that's part of the evaluation plan, plan is asking our providers, what can we aim for? Because really they're the ones that are delivering the services. We don't fund them. Yeah. But what we do is the kind of the low hanging fruit. We help market, advertise, get the word out. And we pay for things that we, you know, we can't pay for with city funds. Uh, but really the question is to them. And so what we did it recently, we met with their evaluation consultant as a team. We've done that two to three times and we are now prepared to work with our community partners to expand the very specific metrics that we agree uh, we're going to track. Uh, first set those goals, right? And then identify what are those metrics that are going to tell us if we're gonna get there over the next year to three years. Okay. So we'll be asking them and that's part of the plan you'll be seeing Great. Um, in the fall. Thank you. And I'm sorry if, I'm, if it's sounding repetitive, I'm, I'm sure you had to answer all these questions at the, at the committee meeting. Um, and then I assume we're doing the same thing for DACA and DAPA applicants. Um, do we have a sense about how many of our residents should be able to qualify for DACA or DAPA, but 
haven't gone through the process yet? Do we have any sense of like how much opportunity is there for us to help folks? You know, I don't recall the number, but somehow 15,000 is ringing a bell for me right now. Um, and it may be old data from 2016. Um, so I don't have the data at the, at the tip of my tongue. What I do know is around the citizenship, right? That we have over 83,000 people in the county who are eligible to become citizens. Yeah. Um, but I'm afraid I don't have the DACA number for you. Okay. I can get that for you. No, I appreciate it. I, I look forward to having this conversation again in the fall and we can really kind of delve in and hopefully set strong goals that we can all push together on. I, I think, again, I, I, I know I'm repeating myself, but it just seems to me that, you know, if we're all pushing on this, this is one way we can really have a, a real impact in reducing fear in our community and helping many of our families be able to survive and thrive here. Uh, Council Member Carrasco. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I um, <clears throat> thank you so much. You you've asked a, a few of the questions that I've uh, I've also been concerned about. Can you close that that door? There, my my corner of of my world is extremely noisy, and I don't know if you can hear it, but it makes it very difficult for me to hear all of you. Um, <clears throat> And, and one of the questions that I have, you know, as we're as we're looking at at the diversity of the city of San Jose and uh, and looking at how we're supporting our residents, uh, one of the concerns I have is how do we support uh, those who are coming into our city? You know, maybe ten years ago, if we looked at our uh, Latino, Latina, Latinx uh, community, we were at about thirty five percent. Now we are. What what is uh, our population now, Sulma? So um, it it's it's over that. So well, the immigrant community represents or foreign born community represents nearly 90, 39 percent. Um, for the Latino community, it's about twenty five percent. It's larger for Asian Pacific Islander. Yeah, I, I'm I'm talking specifically the Latino community. About about twenty five. About twenty five. So we mm -hmm. went from thirty five to 25, which to me is a huge concern when I think about uh, what those uh, factors uh, are uh, uh, that are driving us out of the city of San Jose. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in having conversations with uh, Somos, Luna, uh, having conversations with a lot of our stakeholders, uh, having conversations with uh, Franklin McKinley School District, having conversations with the Alam Rock School District, uh, our own parents, uh, people uh, who are in my district, uh, you know, the cost of living, uh, uh, unable to meet, uh, make ends meet, unable to uh, just simply live in the city of San Jose. Um, it, it's uh, just a very, very difficult um, uh, environment to continue to live and, and thrive for, for many different reasons, whether it's uh, uh, transportation, uh, cost of living, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We know, we know, we know this. And uh, I've been on policy link with some of our, uh, our stakeholders. Um, we were on it for two years and uh, we're, we're just seeing um, displacement and gentrification happening through throughout the entire country. And so this is not a phenomena that's, that's, uh, that's exclusive to the city of San Jose. So uh, uh, I see the Office of Immigrant Affairs also taking a, a lead role in trying to really see how, what kinds of tools we have in our toolbox to, to support our families and, uh, and especially the immigrant uh, communities to see how we can help them um, uh, survive some of these uh, issues that are, are really um, uh, very difficult to maneuver through and, and, uh, and see how we can partner. Uh, but one of the things that I've included in, in the memo that I submitted, uh, aside from using language, I did meet with some of the, the stakeholders that called in today. I was listening. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm all ears and I'm open to suggestions and um, uh, interested in, in continuing the dialogue and engaging and, and wanting to allow individuals to self-identify and have the space to be able to do so. Um, I've, I've never said, uh, remove it, don't do it, don't use it. I've simply have said, don't use it exclusively uh, and don't deny the A or the O from people who choose to use it for themselves as self-identity. 
uh, because this is uh, delicate waters. And, uh, and so in, in an attempt to be inclusive, sometimes we're exclusive. So um, uh, there was a, 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 a stakeholder that came in and, uh, and talked about uh, the space uh, in uh, the Filipino community. And, um, and, uh, and I simply uh, uh, wish to be able to offer the same opportunity to the Latino community. So uh, in my memo, uh, it uh, speaks uh, to that point as well. So Latinx as well as Latino Latina. Um, and also to reintroduce uh, the anti-Blackness uh, in an attempt not to erase the history that uh, one of the speakers was uh, um, very explicit in, uh, in conveying that. And so that's in the memo. Uh, one of the other items that was in the memo was, uh, was the issue of uh, violence that a lot of our immigrant communities are fleeing from. And I think that we're poised in a very interesting position as they're coming into the city and allows us to be a bridge between uh, stakeholders, uh, between providers, and between our immigrant communities to convene and bridge uh, those relationships and be able to provide support systems uh, to the immigrant community when they are uh, caught in a situation where they're fleeing violence uh, or being exploited and, uh, and it's a way that we can support our immigrant community uh, from domestic violence, sex trafficking, uh, or human trafficking. And so that's another item that I've included. I know that this was part of the conversation that we were having at NSC. I believe that was on, on May 20th. And I believe Council Member uh, Arenas um, uh, brought up this point. Um, if, she, uh, if she so chooses to also elaborate on that, I think that she captured it uh, beautifully, but I did wanna make sure to include that and capture it in, in the memo. Uh, we have some great providers in our county that I think that we can use. In fact, uh, part of the budget was uh, allocating some funding to uh, Nextdoor, who happens to be, uh, uh, you know, happens to have uh, 50 years of expertise under their belt. And I think that that's just one of the providers and partners that we could uh, uh, refer individuals to in order to get the support that uh, they may not know where to go to. So um, uh, I won't make the motion yet because I, I wanna be able to continue having the dialogue, but actually I'm going to make a motion. I'm going to make a motion to move my memo um, and, uh, and would like to uh, continue the conversation before moving council member Sparza's as well. Second. All second. Second. Okay, so to be clear, Councilmember Crosby, you're just moving your memo. Yes, uh, okay. and not because uh, uh, I won't accept uh, Councilmember Sparses, but I would like uh, to have a conversation about Councilmember Sparses. Okay, uh, Councilmember Pross. Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, appreciate the report as well and the extensive amount of work. This was uh, certainly a moment of pride for a number of us in the council as we were able to create the Office of, of Immigrant Affairs and, and set out this plan. And uh, as the mayor pointed out, um, almost immediately went on the defensive. And so unfortunately, I think a lot of the, the work, uh, the ambitions that we had for this office, um, we had to shift, we had to shift that, that work plan and, and our focus. But at the same time, I think we've been able to do a tremendous amount of work and we see the opportunities ahead. And I think that's, that's detailed here uh, in the report, and I thank um, both of my my colleagues as well for uh, their memorandums uh, on this item, and and um, I, I I could personally agree with those. I'll, I'll I won't ask to include uh, Council Member as far as this memo uh, as I, I believe um, I'll, I'll allow Council Member Carrasco to take the mic back and, and have a discussion with it. But I, I I'd be willing to support that, and I, I will say that in regards to to being able to utilize the um, the, the personnel and the experts in this office, I think it's a great space to have this discussion around the terminology of, of uh, Latinx. And I think that uh, that sort of surprised a number of us as it sort of caught fire and, and, and be, began uh, you know, being used everywhere, uh, media and, and publications and, uh, and then obviously right within government. And uh, I, I'm a, a board member with the organization that has the term Latino in its name. And as we were 
going through our own uh, strategic plan that that conversation came up amongst us as board members you know do we look at changing the you know the, the title within even our own name or what do we put within the document and ultimately after a pretty robust uh, discussion that actually had a lot of differing opinions we kept the name uh, Latino uh, within our, our the title of our organization and uh, but throughout the document we actually did uh, utilize sort of all three Latino Latina and Latinx uh, I think we, we tried to, to, to understand uh, the, the reasoning behind it and then uh, I think uh, the message that it portrayed but also I think just the the, the organization itself and, and knowing uh, the universal acceptance of Latino and, and, and what that means within the, the Latino community um, and uh, and then at the same time trying to be inclusive and so I, I, I look forward to that because I, I think that has been something that is, is more of a uh, you know like a dinner table uh, conversation that people have had we there haven't really been any spaces that that i've seen where that conversation uh has been able to to be had uh more formally and so i, I look forward to our uh our office taking uh, a little bit of a lead in that and, and appreciate councilman carrasco when they ask for that um and so again i i am willing to accept uh councilman Sparza's memo but i won't ask for that at the moment i'll i'll, I'll turn it back over to uh maybe council member well i see as far as has her hand up so <laughs> great that's it for me mayor thanks Thank you, Councilmember Sparza. Thank you, Mayor, and um, and uh, thank you to Councilmember Carrasco um, for bringing this up and dropping her memo. Um, I wanted to thank Zulma and the Office of Immigrant Affairs for bringing the report forward, and all the community groups that have done so much work um, to to get to this point. Um, not just in developing the report, but in the services that are so needed throughout our city. And um, I wanted to um, to mention a couple of things. I think <clears throat> just tonight, we've had some dialogue around the term Latino, Latina, and Latinx, um, which is interesting from a linguistic standpoint, but there's there are a number of thoughts and opinions on it. And I think ultimately, um, we want to land on uh, we want to land on terminology that is the most inclusive. And what in my conversations with other folks on this, um, the county, for example, has landed on using multiple terminologies. Um, and so we don't rely on one term, right? And so I think that needs to be part of the discussion and more work. Um, needs to happen so that we are we land on the point where we are the most inclusive. Um, I also wanted to um, address um, anti-blackness um, as well as other discrimination that exists. Um, and I wanted to recognize that anti-blackness has a particularly unique and ugly history, and that nearly every other racial group in this country has a history of anti-Blackness, and we should address that head on. And um, I also, in conversations with folks doing this work, um, I uh, that's why I included the separated, the intra-group dialogue versus the inter-group dialogue. My goal, my thinking around the memo that I um, submitted last week was that this is a beginning, that this is a start, that we need more dialogue in our community, um, not less, um, and that this is work that is needed in our community in order to grow. Um, and so I felt that, um, Actually, I, I talked a lot about the intergroup dialogue with folks and, and had some really good conversations about that. And, um, and then uh, some folks recommended that intergroup dialogue happen as a first step. Um, so anyway, I just, I thought that that was um, something that we should offer more of in our community. Um, and, uh, and also that's why I wrote in the background that we take learnings from other groups. Um, for example, um, the Compadres Network, um, has done some intergroup dialogue and that we sort of build on the experience of other organizations that have done intergroup and intergroup dialogue. 
So I would ask for a friendly amendment um, to Council Member Carrasco if she would be open to including my memo. Absolutely. Thank you. And that's it for me, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions, Council Member Arenas? Oh, sorry, I was having a bit of a technical difficulty there. Um, I want to just thank all the speakers who um, called in today. Um, is this an, I'm sorry, I just, uh, there's a fireworks outside of, in my neighborhood and just, uh, anyways, it really shocked me. Um, so, uh, one of the one of the reasons that that I that we at the um, neighborhood services and education um, committee um, talk so extensively about uh, Latino Latina Latinx is um, because this is of course tied to our identities um, and our genders are obviously tied to our, our identities and I want to reiterate what Councilmember. Uh, Carrasco said that there wasn't ever an intention to remove, it was to um, have a O backslash A backslash X, because our intention is to really be inclusive of everybody. And so um, I'm not going to um, continue with that, that conversation because I think the important thing is what, are, what does our community say? Um, and that's important to find out. I think we can't say that all uh, folks embrace Latinx or Latino or Latina. We can't say that all people um, embrace Hispanic. That, that one's really outdated and no one embraces that it seems like. Or Mexican American or Chicano. So we have lots of different names um, lots of different labels, and many of those come with a political intent. And so I appreciate the intent of our community to make sure that we're all inclusive, and that was the intention of, of our committee. Um, so thank you, everyone, for your um, comments, and, and thank you, Councilmember Carrasco, uh, for clarifying that, and Councilmember um, Esparza for your memo. Um, I'm going to move into some of the recommendations that I had talked about during committee. And, uh, and thank you, um, Suma, for including many of those um, that I see on, on, the, on the replacement memo. Um, one, of, one of the, under the executive summary or background, I know that um, you talked about in September 2015, the mayor and the city council adopted a welcome to San Jose resolution. Um, I, I would like to recognize that council member um, uh, Carrasco and council member um, Perales were the ones who led this um, conversation, I think jointly um, with the mayor at um, some point. And, um, and I think it's worth the mention in, in a report. And I, um, I move on from there. Secondly, some of my feedback that I that I provided um, based on uh, the audit that was completed on this program, I asked um, for further partnership with the council, and I see it integrated here. But particularly, I had asked. Um, for the voices of our community to be um, integrated into this work plan. And there is a, a disconnect in the, at this time between um, council and Office of Immigrant Affairs, as we don't really jointly um, uh, coordinate events or um, uh, bring people uh, together uh, collectively. And, and I think it's a really missed opportunity. And I look forward to actually doing that more. Um, we, you know, in my district, we have a huge immigrant community. It's Indian, it's Vietnamese, it's Filipino or Filipina, um, it's Mexican um, and 
Latino, Latinx of all just, you know, just all of many different countries. And so um, I'm, I know that I, I spoke to you about the, the group that had already um, contributed to this work plan, but it was a smaller group and it was during uh, the pandemic and you know, there's so many limitations that I don't know it's as thorough as I'd like it to be um, in representing um, folks in my district. I would like to see District 8 and District 5 and District 7 and District 9, whoever those districts are and those groups that reside in, in those um, areas, for their voices to also be heard. Um, how do you plan to do that? How do you plan to incorporate these voices? Yeah, so part of, as you know, now that it's under the Office of Racial Equity, part of our racial equity principles is to center community voice. And so in whatever we're doing, whether we're planning, we're doing policy development or we're shaping programs or helping departments design things um, in service of immigrants or refugees, uh, we would apply the same principles that we apply. We were going, we we're basically going to apply to everything, which is, you know, ultimately, what is the impact that we want to have? What does the data tell us about that? And what does community say about the, either policy or the program that we're aiming to create? Um, and then followed by accountability. So the community engagement piece is really a process um, that will be a standard process for the way that we conduct our business and the way that we've demonstrated. Um, since we started the Office of Racial Equity in, in October and the way that we've worked with our community partners um, over the last few years. So that is that is on top of mind for all of us. And we I don't know that we've ever done anything without uh, reaching into the community, but I do appreciate the fact that now we'll have more opportunities to work with council offices across the city and that we'll have opportunities to engage with the neighborhood associations that you work with closely because you have the ties in the community. And so I think that is an opportunity for us to be able to expand rather than just lean on our um, community organizations, partner organizations, but really lean on the community, or pardon me, the council offices who um, are the constituents that you serve. And so if anything, that's, the, that's gonna be the difference in the way it's the who we engage, not necessarily the, the how. Um, well, I was talking, I wasn't talking necessarily about, about outreach, but I appreciate the um, delving a little bit more into that. Uh, so my, what I was talking about is um, pulling the voices of the, of the community into the work plan. This work plan is going to um, dictate the work from 20, uh, 2021 to 2024. And I don't know that it has enough feedback in the work plan. And what I had asked in committee was um, to figure out a way to pull those voices from my district. I know that there isn't an immigrant um, agency active in my district because I don't have any nonprofits in my district. So I'm systematically left out unless it's at a school um, and, 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 and then community is integrated that way. So um, I hope that what I could do, and I, I can ask uh, Council Member Carrasco, she would accept, but I want you to, I want you to uh, give me a feedback first, Sulma. I'd like to see an addendum to this so that there that there are um, a variety of community members contributing to the overall work plan that come from um, the districts that have a lot of um, immigrant communities in them. Well, I, you know, there, I think when we, let me go back. So when the Welcoming San Jose Plan 2.0 was created and developed with community in 2019, um, we were supposed to go to NSC in 2020, but then those meetings were canceled. So then the pandemic hit. At the fall of last year, we decided to go back to partners and say, in the absence of starting all over again, um, let's revisit, let's refresh this, and let's look again at what we developed and ask the partners what is still relevant in, in the strategies of the Welcoming San Jose Plan. Um, what could be taken off? and um, what's, what's missing. So I, we feel like we, the community partners provided at least a fresh look at the strategies. And I would, 
really be pleased if we can have an opportunity to to move and to advance the welcoming San Jose plan over this next year, and would be happy to reflect on once we have our evaluation plan. Um, and at the end of the fiscal year, the next fiscal year, ask ourselves, okay, maybe that's a time to also do some spot checks and focus groups with various community members to make sure that the plan um, represents their, their viewpoint and their aspirations. Uh, but I really feel very confident in the strategies that are in this plan that, are, that look at economic mobility, to education, to safety, uh, to leadership, to engagement, to access. Um, and, and I, you know, I want to honor the work of the people who participated in, in developing this and would really prefer to give this a one year and then reassess and then identify focus groups around the city who can engage into a conversation about, about um, the work plan. I see. Um, well, we're systematically leaving my district out and um, and I don't know that that's very welcoming for me um, or for my district. And um, I know that part of the audit um, was to develop more of a, um, a, a improved feedback and accountability through a community advisory group. Um, and I think this is part of the work that needs to get done over this next year. Um, we, we move um, a, another year with um, missing voices. And to me, that's, I, I like for us to do a bit more analysis of who it was who contributed um, I know we took a look at it um, um, initially, um, but I don't. I don't. I want to make sure that it's it's better integrated. So I don't want another second year of of people missing from this plan. So, Council Member uh, Angel Real, Deputy City Manager, and uh, you know. Uh, in the plan under leadership and communication, uh, goal number three, I think may be getting to what you're asking for, which is, uh, and, and that goal basically calls out to develop a city council and a county communication mechanism to ensure consistent and timely messaging and information dissemination to the immigrant community and a structure to discuss coordination of policy and procedures that impact the immigrant community. I think what you're talking about there uh, may align with that. And, and, and now that you've elaborated more in terms of what you'd like to see, especially in your district where you are very uh, nonprofit kind of deficient, right? In, in terms of that district, perhaps we could take your feedback and align it with goal three under leadership and communication and build that out a little bit more. I'd like to propose that as a potential next step. I think we could achieve what you want to do uh, in that section. I appreciate that. I, I think that's a it's a great um, uh, idea. Um, and so I, I will take that and I will um, uh, move on. But uh, I think we need to learn from lessons in, in terms of if if we understood in this, so you, you said, that, that folks were really techno technologically um, challenged this last year, um, then it is safe to assume that not everybody got onto Zoom, not, not everybody that you typically would have expected to be part of this conversation, be part of this conversation. And so um, th this that is my main concern. The second thing is that I think as, um, I think as we, uh, face some of these issues, um, I, I would think that you would look to um, maybe the NSC committee um, for some uh, brainstorming on this. So if you, if there were some technological issues, then maybe what we could have done is had CETF under Jill's leadership connect with this um, immigrant community so that they wouldn't be so challenged or it wouldn't have taken so long to, um, you know, really get with, uh, with Zoom. Is, is that part of, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, um, how did these folks get their training or uh, get advanced at technologically where they left to their own devices? And 
No, I, I think we're conflating some issues here. So um, the example that I gave was related to citizenship workshops, and there was a pause on doing citizenship workshops last year in 2020. Um, and then the small workshops that did happen, there was um, you know limited um, numbers of people who participated for a number of reasons, fear and you know census was still on their mind and a number of things. But the good news is that you know, over 2,000 people registered just recently. And so whatever the work that was done related to digital inclusion over the last year has proved to work. And so I think that we're well on our way and even our legal service providers were quite surprised at how comfortable people are now in, um, in using you know, devices. So that's the good news there. You know, the other piece I wanna say about um, you know, being inclusive in, in offering um, you know, points of view for this plan. That's part of the reason why we want to create this advisory group. And that advisory group, you know, we still haven't decided what the composition of the group will be, but in our mind, it's going to be both um, community-based organizations as well as people in the community. And so, um, you know, when at our next one-on-one, -on -one, I'd like to have, you know, a conversation with you council member about, you know, members, a, a member of your community that we ought to speak with that might be able to be a good voice for District 8. I really appreciate that. Um, I have to pipe up um, in so many different areas because um, as Angela, you recognize that we are nonprofit deficient, but we are, we're um, full of other uh, assets and attributes um, out in a district eight. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, I think the rest of what I asked for, um, and I think council member Carrasco already talked about it with, which was the human trafficking, sex trafficking and gender identity domestic violence and sexual orientation piece. And so thank you for including that. Um, uh, I also asked to have a, uh, for a, the development of a matrix with measurable goals and outcomes to hold city departments accountable for racial equity action plans. Um, and so I'm not sure that I see that. Yes, council member. So I mentioned that um, that piece is with the racial equity team and it's identified in MBA number 22. There's an attachment to the member to the MBA number 22 that has just a very high level of the work plan. Um, in that we identify it, part of our OKRs is to create department level racial equity teams as well as racial equity action plans. And that's not the immigrant affairs team who will be leading that. It will no longer equity. be. It'll be the racial equity team. Okay. I have both teams uh, under the auspices of the Office of Racial Equity. Okay. Um, wonderful. Well, um, I'm doing just a double check on all my suggestions, and I think I see them all for uh, under the the replacement memo, and I'm assuming that that's part of the motion. Um, anyway, so I really appreciate that. I um, would love to see uh, a greater partnership um, uh, between, you know, I, I won't speak for anybody else, but between um, my office, my community, and the Office of Immigrant Affairs, as well as the Office of Race and Equity. Um, this is, these are tough times. I know I don't have to tell you, you were in um, the OEC and so, or the EOC, <laughs> all of these abbreviations. Um, and so, for me, there is a lot of urgency to build relationships and to continue to um, support our our community. Um, and I know that um, the audit also stated that there was um, a need to include more API community. And I certainly have um, a considerable uh, segment of my community um, API. And so I want to make sure that that those folks also get included. Um, I appreciate the, the report. Um, I look forward to seeing what we can add. Um, and thank you, Angel, for brainstorming with me on that. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? All right, let's vote on the motion. Perez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Cohen? Roscoe? 
Crosco? David? I, think I, I hear you. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Lee? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. I'm going back to Cohen. Okay, I'm going to mark absent. Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, Rhonda, item 3.12, which is a status report uh, on November 2018 ballot measure T, disaster preparedness, public safety infrastructure general obligation bond. There's a presentation. I, I just want to note for everyone that we have now, uh, it looks like six more items it is now nine o'clock. And I want to encourage all my colleagues to be as succinct as possible. Uh, so that way we can uh, get to all these items before uh, we all turn into pumpkins at midnight. Uh, thank you very much. There's a presentation. Thank you, Matt Kano, Director of Public Works, and with me presenting today is Catherine Brown, Deputy Director, and a number of our partner departments are also with us today. And I'll turn it over to Catherine for the beginning of the presentation. All right. Thank you, Matt. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor, City Council members. Uh, as Matt mentioned, my name is Catherine Brown. I'm a Deputy Director in Public Works overseeing the Measure T program. Today, we're presenting in the, on the status report for the Measure T Disaster Preparedness, Public Safety, and Infrastructure Bond. Um, before jumping into project updates, I just want to give a quick high-level overview of the program. Measure T was a voter approved in 2018 and provides for the issuance of $650 million in general obligation bonds. We have approximately $114 million budgeted to be expended in this upcoming fiscal year. The second bond issuance of just over $200 million is scheduled for this July, with a third issuance scheduled for July 2024. The Community Oversight Committee for this program is made up of a total of 15 seats, of which four remain vacant in District 3, District 8, and the at-large seats for the business and environmental focus. Next slide, please. Uh, jumping into our project updates, I'll begin with the street repair program. This program has $300 million of Measure T funds allocated, which will be repairing approximately 388 miles of local and neighborhood streets throughout the city. The 20, in 2020, the Department of Transportation completed the resurfacing and construction of 74 miles of local neighborhood streets. And this year, DOT plans to repair another 78 miles. Next slide, please. Uh, the next program is our bridge repair and rehabilitation program. The Measure T program allocated $20 million for city-owned bridges. Um, and as previously reported, staff is actively working on a delivery strategy uh, attempting to leverage multiple funding opportunities, uh, such as Measure T and up to $61 million of the Highway Bridge Program federal aid funding, which consists of bridge investment credits, or called BICs. Um, due to recent shorting or funding shortfalls in the HBP program, the eligibility criteria for bridge repairs and replacements has changed, and funding is now limited to non-operational bridges or bridges that need to be completely replaced. So our plan is still to pursue the HBP HBP program, um, but because the city's bridges are all falling outside of this new eligibility criteria, the city's original plan to leverage Measure T and the BIC credits for up to $80 million is uh, facing challenges. So however, the, the program's funding situation is evolving and staff will be ready to apply as soon as funding becomes available. Uh, moving down to our public safety program, starting with the fire stations. We have identified site locations for four of the six fire stations, which include fire stations 37, 20, 8, and 32. Fire stations 37 and 20 are both currently under construction and scheduled to be completed in early 2022. The relocation of fire station 8 and the new fire station 32 are both in the beginning stages of design. Uh, construction for these projects is scheduled to start in late 2022, being completed in mid-2024. Uh, the two remaining fire stations, fire station uh, 23 and 36, are still in need of sites. Uh, we've identified a potential site for 36 and are conducting a feasibility study on that site. And then for fire station 23, uh, the property search is continuing. It's been challenging to find a property that meets the criteria falling within the budget and the, um, the fire department's optimal response time requirements. But recently, we've identified this site as a potential candidate for co-development with uh, Public Works and the Housing Department to construct a fire station and affordable housing. Next slide. Uh, moving on to the police infrastructure, uh, starting with the police department's training and, and academy facility. 
Uh, earlier this year in March, we received council approval to purchase the property located at 300 Enzo. Staff anticipates starting the design in the coming months with construction scheduled to start in 2022 and completion scheduled for mid 2024. And then the last one on this slide is the 911 call center that I wanted to touch on. Uh, the design for this project is planned to start this summer. And this project will expand the 911 call center into the existing emergency operations center. Construction is expected to start after the EOC has completely moved out of, into their new facility, which is currently scheduled in, for December 2022. Next slide. And then speaking of emergency operations center, uh, this project began construction in March of this year. So the picture in the background shows a rendering of the completed project and the picture in the foreground shows uh, the construction site as of last week. So the training tower and surfacing parking portions of this project are scheduled to be completed by April, 2022 with the new and remodeled buildings being completed by December of 2022. And now I would like to turn it over to Matt Kano. Thank you, Catherine. Um, this, is a this table is also included in the report we have in front of you today. This is a tracking of our public safety reserves. We had $175 million in the public safety category and we want to ensure that we can continue to deliver and the commitment we made to the voters in the public safety category. So we're closely tracking those reserves. In our last report, um, those reserves were at negative 750,000 based on recent cost estimates and bid results, it has grown. Um, but if we, if we go back to September 11, 2018, we presented a list of public safety and other environmental protection and other projects to the voters um, prior to the voter vote going to the ballot. Um, and then in November, 2018, the voters approved it. Later in November, 2018, um, we, the mayor and city council approved two additional fire stations to be added to the public safety category. So it is tight. Um, I'm happy that the number is not a lot larger than one and a half million dollars, but I am personally not happy that it is negative and showing in the red right now. And I feel a bit strong personal commitment and professional commitment to deliver um, these public safety projects to the voters. So we are tracking this very closely. Um, it is important for us to continue to look for project savings in this and other categories in Measure T to continue to make sure that we can make up for any project deficits. Um, it's always that last project um, that, um, that would have challenges if we do end up running over. Um, in the original public safety bond um, a few decades ago, that was fire station 37. In this public safety bond, um, the last two fire stations are fire station 32 and council district seven, which Captain mentioned, we think we have a good site for. So I'm hopeful we can move forward with that in the near future. And then fire station 23 and council district four that we don't have a good site for right now. And so if we do have funding challenges with the public safety category, fire station 23 would likely be the one that would be challenged. Measure T, um, the lighting category on LED, we are moving forward with converting the remainder um, in partnership with DOT, of course, uh, and pg &E, converting the remainder of the street lights to LED. Um, that'll be completed by the end of this calendar year or very shortly thereafter. And then we will proceed likely next calendar year with a separate procurement for smart controllers for the LED street lights. City facility LED lighting. We have been progressing with parks and trails as the primary priority um, based on previous discussion with the mayor and city council. We'll be finished with the conversion of those parks and trails by mid next year. We're currently in a procurement for the smart controllers for city facilities lighting, um, and we'll begin the installation of those later this year as well. Um, a, few more, a few more slides here. So in the Measure T, we also have clean water and green infrastructure and storm drain improvement projects. We are proceeding with the construction or the design of the River Oaks Green Infrastructure Project in Council District 4, as well as the preliminary design of the Charcot storm drainage improvements, which are also in Council District 4. After the River Oaks project is completed, of the 25 million we originally had in the green infrastructure category, we're going to have roughly 18 to 19 million dollars left. We've been working throughout this year, we've discussed with the community, the Parks and Rec Commission, and T E committee as well. What are those next projects um, that would be recommended to spend the rest of that money? Um, in addition to that $19 million, we have a commitment as a city to continue to build green infrastructure projects into the future. Um, this list you have in front of you right now, um, Story Keys is identified as a high near-term priority for us in the, in the Measure T report you have in front of you because it would leverage a significant amount of grant dollars. The remainder of the projects on this list are our priorities for that next stage of feasibility study. 
So we'll be taking Sycamore, Monterey, Hellier, Phelan, and the Kelly Park gravel lot into that next stage of feasibility over the next handful of months. And later this year, year we'll be reporting back to you on our recommendations for the remainder of that money. The, um, a big intent of Measure T was to make sure our community centers are shelter ready, um, not just during major disasters, but even weeks like now, uh, the community centers, as you all know, are used um, as cooling centers um, and obviously during major disasters as shelters. We wanna make sure that our major hub community centers in each council district are prepared for these disasters and can work um, when there's a large earthquake. Um, staff work really closely in Parks and Rec and Public Works and other departments, emergency services, to take a look at all of our large community centers and make sure they're capable of having generator or battery hookups um, in an emergency, HVAC and ventilation improvements, seismic and roof repairs. Um, the list in front of you, and there's a lot more information on the report, shows a prioritized list based on equity, um, uh, with, with equity in mind of how we would tackle these improvements in the community centers. As you can see, there is a deficit showing in our cost estimate. We have $12.95 million in Measure T money available. That's all we plan and are committed to spending out of Measure T on these projects. We are hopeful um, that we can get to all of these projects and with Measure T dollars because we're with um, the Parks and Rec Department and the Housing Department are talking about potential partnership projects at Southside and Cypress. So that will probably provide significant savings there. So again, we are hopeful we can get to all these projects with Measure T money but we're very clear in our language in our report that um, the maximum we're planning on recommending spending on the community center projects out of Measure T is $12.95 million. And with that, we're, Catherine and I, as well as a number of members of our team and other department par partners are here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Matt. And <clears throat> thank you, Catherine. And most importantly, thanks to you and your whole teams for the great work. I, I've been a part of leading or participating in many campaigns for various bond and capital measures. And I have to say, this has been the most successful implementation I've ever seen of a major capital measure. Um, either I'm thinking about different measures I've been involved in in terms of transit and uh, shore restoration. And, um, you know, even after the fact, as I came in as a council member, uh, dealing with implementation of parks and public safety bonds that had predated me. And this is, uh, by far been the smoothest and really impressed by how quickly we've been able to get projects out the door and out on the street for our community to see. Uh, so thank you for all that you guys have done collectively. All right, uh, let's go to the community first. Start with Juliana Pendleton. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Juliana Pendleton and I represent the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society as the Environmental Advocacy Assistant. Our organization has endorsed Measure T. We strongly advocated for the measure and believe we were instrumental in securing its approval by voters. We speak in support of the memo by council members Arenas, Carrasco, and Cohen, asking to invest remaining Measure T funds in the improvement of water quality at Lake Cunningham. Done right, this investment can create a system of constructed wetlands to treat the water in the lake. Constructed wetlands are green infrastructure projects aiming to clean water from nutrients and pollutants, and at the same time provide habitat for fish and birds and opportunities for the public to enjoy nature. Lake Cunningham is an important resource for East San Jose and the city at large. Please invest in making it thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Eddie Garcia. I'm a lifelong resident of East San Jose. Uh, I grew up in District 5 and have lived in District 8 for 30 years. Um, I actually remember uh, the day that uh, Lake Cunningham opened. Uh, there was a buzz in the air and excitement in the community. And uh, I hope you support uh, Council Members Arenas, Carrasco, and Cohen's recommendation to use Measure T funds to improve the water quality there and improve the safety at Lake Cunningham. It, it's not only an east side treasure, but it's a regional treasure. And uh, our community, uh, I think, would get the same kind of buzz and excitement uh, if uh, uh, once again, uh, Lake Cunningham was accessible to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Blair? Uh, 
Hi, thank you. About the smart street light issue, I think I will try to bring that up at uh, uh, Rules and Open Government and PISPIS this week. Um, about items about uh, bridge repair and overpass repair, um, I'm interested how um, this sounds sort of like uh, earthquake retrofit ideas. And uh, I'm interested that, you know, many cities could be practicing these kind of ideas at this time. Um, I, at the meeting that is now on YouTube, the Measure T public meeting for June, um, it's now on YouTube. They um, asked that uh, they want to start a, a public outreach process, and they're going to be talking to council persons in the next few months to figure out what that could be. You know, uh, maybe it has something to do with better uh, how to talk about uh, possible upcoming natural disasters more and open public policy. Bring that in. It's important. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Gabriel. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Gabriel Manrique, current organizer of Luna. I urge the City Council to save and restore Lake Cunningham and approve Council Member Sarenas Carrasco and Cohen's memo, which prioritizes open space for East San Jose families. Lake Cunningham is the only open space accessible to many or under underserved communities in East San Jose, and, it, and that is why it's so important to save it. Uh, the remaining funds from Measure T can help revitalize Lake Cunningham for an open space that can be enjoyed by families from East San Jose. Please approve the memo from Council Members Arenas Carrasco and Cohen's. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, YN, welcome. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Welcome. I'm Yan, I'm Yan Trung with Mothers Out Front. Some of my favorite memories are swimming and splashing around in, in rivers, lakes, and beaches. Children deserve such experiences. Years of redlining has deprived East San Jose of parks and recreational spaces. Revitalizing Lake Kenningham gets more kids and families outside and more active. People will walk, swim, hike, jog, bike, and kayak, all of which is fantastic for, for health outcomes. Please vote for the Lake Cunningham proposal to address equity long overdue. Kids deserve this, along with the investing with trees uh, as proposed by CM Carrasco. Trees help protect the, the lungs of young children. They help protect against asthma and lifelong medical costs. The trees and the lake will provide some relief from the urban uh, island heat effect, a climate effect that affects um, the east side disproportionately. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, Arvind, welcome. Thank you. My name is Arvind Kumar, and I've lived in District 8 since 1988. I'm a volunteer at the two acre native plant garden at Lake Cunningham, which is maintained by members of the California Native Plant Society and community volunteers. Together, we log almost 1000 volunteer hours every year. Lake Cunningham Regional Park is the best resource for nature-based recreation in this corner of San Jose for walkers, joggers, birders, photographers, and others who enjoy nature in the city. We recognize that the water quality of the lake is affected by the quality of the land around it. The rocks and the asphalt and the concrete that encircle the lake today promote runoff. Instead, what the lakeshore needs is more riparian and wetland native vegetation to filter out contaminants. The park in general needs more native vegetation. I urge you to approve funding for water quality improvement at Lake Cunningham. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 3627. Uh, who, there you go. Yeah, this is Sammy Beza. I live in District 8. I've been living here since 1974. I'd just like to say I'd like to support also, Council Sylvia Reynas, David Cohen, and Magdalena Carrasco in the Measure T Environmental and Flood Council uh, for the project for Lake Cuttingham to save Lake Cuttingham for all the activities. Um, that's all I have. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dave, welcome. Good evening. On behalf of the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter, I urge you to support Council Member Arenas' memo to allocate the remaining clean water funds for Lake Cunningham. At Sierra Club, we discuss these issues with our conservation committees, with wildlife habitat, recreation, environmental justice, and other wide ranging issues uh, and interest uh, represented uh, within the environmental community. So we are, are well aware of the competing needs for detention ponds and green streets. And in Southwest San Jose, we have a similar water quality problem at uh, Almaden Lake. However, Valley Water will be resolving Almaden Lake's uh, water quality issues. So we believe that allocating Measure T funds for water quality improvements at Lake Cunningham and thus providing the uh, improved wildlife habitat and much needed access uh, to nature-based recreation to residents uh, of East San Jose is an equitable and valuable payoff for the remaining water quality funds. Thank you all who- Thank you, Dave. Uh, Casey Hill, welcome, Casey. Good evening, Mayor Licardo and council members. My name is Casey Hill and I represent Vedulution and the Cise Puede Collective. I'm a resident of District 6. I urge you to save and revitalize Lake Cunningham and improve council members Arenas, Carrasco, and Cohen's memo prioritizing open space and recreational activities for East San Jose families. To prepare, I reached out to our staff and community residents. One staff member from East San Jose recalled memories of year-end school trips and birthdays at Lake Cunningham, the same memory she is now making with her own children. Community members repeatedly stressed its importance as a place for their families to nurture their physical and mental well-being. They also expressed concern for the deferred maintenance and deteriorating water quality at Lake Cunningham that has resulted in fewer available recreational activities. Please approve this menu memo to reaffirm the use of remaining Measure T funds for revitalizing this critical neighborhood asset. This opportunity may not come again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Piolo, welcome. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Piolo Paz, and I am the president of the Green Society Club at Silver Creek High in District 8. And today, my group and I urge the city council to save and revitalize Lake Cunningham and approve council member Arenas Carrasco and Cohen's memo. My club has volunteered at Lake Cunningham Park, and we saw the condition of Lake Cunningham is only getting worse every day. No action is taken to revitalize it. This funding is absolutely necessary to improve the condition of the lake. By letting this lake deteriorate, recreational activities are limited, if not simply impossible, to many East Side San Jose families, especially underprivileged families that do not have the luxury of traveling to other bodies of water. This contributes to the environmental disparity in the city, limiting people residing in East San Jose to their abilities to recreate. We can fix this by approving this memo, and I'm certain that there are many San Jose residents that would benefit from the restoration of the lake. Thank you. Thank you. James Reber. Sorry about that. Anyway, I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the San Jose Parks Foundation. Lake Cunningham is a truly unique park. Uh, it, it covers so many different areas and it, um, it establishes a neighborhood atmosphere. It's definitely a neighborhood park for the east side, but it's also a regional park, but I would call a signature park. And if those water issues can be addressed in any way, shape or form, you're going to get much, much more than just clean water out of it. It's a really good move. I think it's a, it's a economic move and a smart one. And it takes care of a a, a big part of uh, what I think is equity with regard to parks uh, on the east side. So uh, we fully support it and we hope that you will support the use of Measure T funds to clean up Lake Cunningham. Thanks. Thank you. Janet? Thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, council persons Arenas, Carrasco and Cohen for their advocacy for Measure T funds to revitalize Lake Cunningham. The park itself is a wonderful park and it has many attributes and, and is still used quite a bit by residents all around for biking, hiking, walking, 
and enjoying nature, but the lake is declining. Fish are dying. Um, there's no filtration. It's just kind of a, it's, it's stinky. It needs to be, needs to be revitalized. We can be, bring back cultural activities um, on the water like, um, let's see, we can bring back boating and um, other cultural activities. I think there was some outrigger practice at one time. I'd love to see that back again. Thank you. Thank you. Paul? Oh, Paul Soto, I'd like to thank the senora that spoke earlier with regard to redlining and how that led to the um, neglect of uh, investment in that side of town. What, District 6 in Willow Glen was more concerned about putting up shade trees for their horses than they were about putting up an infrastructure because they saw Mexicans as their equals. Okay, this has to be a, a topic of contention. It, it, it has to be something that is articulated clearly and talked about so that when the fund is allocated, other people don't feel like a sense of, like, like a sense of privilege that they can come into that conversation when there is something being done in that moment. And that is a reckoning, a rectitude, a reconciliation, and a reparation of those historical injustices that the Chicano community experienced. Thank you. Luna? Hi, uh, my name is Tony Romero. Um, I'm calling on behalf of uh, Luna, Latinos United for New America. And um, East San Jose families deserve more access to open space. Saving Lake Cunningham would allow families to finally be able to enjoy recreational activities with their loved ones. If we do not save Lake Cunningham, we further worsen the inaccessibility of open spaces for East San Jose families. With the remaining measures, uh, with the remaining major key funds, we have the opportunity to start revitalizing this critical neighborhood. Uh, that can transform our East San Jose community and beyond. This opportunity may not come again, so please approve Council Members Arenas Carrasco's and Cohen's memo. Thank you. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Uh, Luna? Thank you. Uh, we are sharing a, a Zoom account. <laughs> Good uh <-huh>. evening, <laughs> City Council. My name is Mara Pelagio, and I am the Executive Director of Latinos United for Any America. And this time I am calling to advocate for the revitalization of Lake Cunningham and the approval of the memo provided by Council Members Arenas, Carrasco, and Cohen, which prioritize open space and recreational activities in the east side of San Jose and their families. Luna has advocated for open spaces since the creation of our organization in 2013, and we know the importance of having access to the recreational spaces for families in our uh, neighborhoods. Growing up in the east side, Lake Cunningham was a space for my family and, and me to visit and enjoy picnics by the water. And it was the first park I stewarded as a high school student learning about native plants. We have seen the degradation of the water, the decrease in green spaces in the park and a lack of maintenance. We have the opportunity now to invest in the rehabilitation of the park with the remaining uh, Measure T funds. If we do not invest in Lake Cunningham, we further worsen the inaccessibility of open spaces for the East San Jose families. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve, Bennett. Uh, thank you, Mayor, City Council for all your, your hard work. Uh, a number of the leaders in our community use the word ghetto to describe Cunningham Park. You know, the money made there should first be spent on a park before it goes out. Our children play on dead weeds, dirt, and bird droppings. The water, there's no incoming water into the lake. Uh, the lake is the water table. It's green, rancid, allergy, and it's closed. All the boats sit on the shore. People cannot fish anymore. Could we pipe in rainwater from the East Hills uh, to add to the water table? I mean, if we get this going again, uh, San Jose State can have an active crew team. Uh, we can have televised dragon boat races to draw attention to San Jose and make money. Uh, there's a whole list of things. Uh, let's please get this lake back up to par. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Avi, welcome. 
Right. Hi, my name is Avinash Subramanian, and I'm calling on behalf of the Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action Team to urge the City Council to save and revitalize Lake Cunningham. Despite an environmental and equity issue, as underserved communities in East San Jose have been linked to experiencing more respiratory issues and higher temperatures due to climate change. Saving the lake will provide benefits that counter the effects of said climate change in our East San Jose communities. Additionally, saving Lake Cunningham allows the community to uh, the ability to enjoy recreational activities with their loved ones, as well as encourage the preservation of the surrounding flora and fauna. With the remaining Metro T funds, we have the opportunity to start revitalizing this critical neighborhood lake to transform our East San Jose community and beyond. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Amanda? Yes, hello, Mayor and Council Member. Thank you for listening. And I'd like to echo what I've been hearing and just urge the Council to revitalize the Lake Cunningham and just wanted to urge the importance of having natural habitat for both humans as well as species. And as we all probably know, low income communities are already susceptible to limited open space areas. And having these open space areas makes these communities less vulnerable to climate and health risks by lowering local temperatures, improving air quality and mitigating floods. And also providing areas for leisure, community life and ensuring community engagement of rec recreational activities. And at this point, we really need strong political leadership that prioritizes these underserved communities and urban green infrastructure projects. So thank you for hearing me out. And I also urge the council to, to pass measure to um, get Arena's memo passed for Measure T. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shani? Good evening, Mayor Ricardo and City Council. This is Jenny Kleinhaus, the Environmental Advocate for Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. I wish to reiterate my colleague Juliana's comment, as well as other speakers, in support for allocating remaining major T funds to improving water quality in Lake Cunningham. As Juliana said, we suggest looking into the use of green infrastructure in the form of constructed wetlands for the multiple benefits of cleaning the water for it will allow activities, habitat for songbirds, and access to nature to all. I think you can also potentially identify state matching funds for green infrastructure for this purpose. The other thing I wanted to mention is that um, I'm very, we are very glad to see that the uh, city staff is looking at dimming of street lights and other lights in the city. Um, as you know, we're very concerned with light pollution and dimmers are really uh, useful in reducing that. But we're also talking to staff about correlated color temperature because this uh, is a measure that really looks at the impact of the color of the temperature Keisha. on the health of ecosystems and people. Thank, Thank you. you. Jeremy? Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is Jeremy Barus, President of the District 8 Community Roundtable. I'm here to urge the Mayor and Council to support, uh, to adopt uh, Council Member Arenas Carrasco and Cohen's memo uh, calling for the allocation of Measure T funds toward uh, revitalizing Lake Cunningham Park. Lake Cunningham is a gem of our community and our entire city and has served as a gathering place for families and individuals. Just want to uh, just reiterate a lot of the my fellow community uh, members who also spoke and just um, urging the mayor and council to adopt the memo. Thank you. Thank you. Esther uh, Young. Good evening, everyone. My name is Esther Young, and I am calling on behalf of Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action today to urge the City Council to save and revitalize Lake Cunningham, which prioritizes open space and recreational activities for East San Jose families. Due to years and years of the deteriorating water quality at Lake Cunningham, recreational activities like swim, swimming, kayaking, and more were taken away from many East San Jose families. If we do not save Lake Cunningham, we further worsen the inaccessibility of greenery and parks for these families. With Measure T funds, we have the opportunity to start revitalizing this critical neighborhood lake that can transform our East San Jose community and beyond. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, Patricia Mendoza?
Hi, good evening. My name is Patricia Mendoza, and I'm the president of the Evergreen Leadership Neighborhood Association, and Lake Cunningham is within our neighborhood boundary. I would like to urge you to support Councilmember Arenas Carrasco in Cohen's memo. Lake Cunningham is a hidden gem in our East San Jose. It has the potential to be so much more than what it currently is. The quality is stopping it from becoming an amazing asset to our neighborhood, which is already in need of open spaces and safe outdoor recreational activities. Thank you for considering improving the quality of life for San Joseans. And this simple action today will prioritize our families and children for generations to come, bringing back activities such as kayaking, sailing, and swimming lessons to this park will create a positive ripple effect in our youth. Thank you so much. Thank you. Monica Mellon. Hi, this is Monica Mallon from Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action. Like most of the other speakers, I'm calling to urge the mayor and council to save and revitalize Lake Cunningham and approve the memo from council members Arenas, Crosco, and Cohen. I think it's really important to have open space for families. So please support this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Robert Reese. Hello, Robert Reese, District 8 resident. Thank you, Mayor Licardo and council members and city staff for this long, long, long day. It's really hard to imagine that it's also almost been a generation since Lake Cunningham Lake has been able to be utilized for its intended purposes. I appreciate the council's discussion in June of 2020, where they were looking ahead to the expenditure of excess funds from Measure T for the flood control. And I think that uh, it's very fitting that tonight you would support Council Member Arenas, Carrasco, and Cohen's memo. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Peter? Good evening, um, Council Members. I'm Peter from District 7, and I encourage um, the Council today to vote in favor of um, Council Members Arenas, Carrasco, and Cohen's memo um, to, in order to prioritize open spaces and recreation activities for, for East San Jose families by revitalizing um, Lake Cunningham. Lake Cunningham has served as a place for many um, families, especially immigrant families, to, to gather, um, especially during the summer months, to celebrate um, each other and to enjoy nature. Um, unfortunately, that service has been gradually deteriorating, and so now I encourage the city council to invest in our communities and revitalize that in order to build a community and a city that works for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Roland? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to quickly share, you know, what an extraordinary place uh, Lake Cunningham uh, was uh, 30 years ago. The marina has a beautiful sandy beach where I was able to safely teach my daughters how to windsurf. And I really hope that we can bring it back to its former glory. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael? Hi, my name is Mike. I'm living in District 4. I think it's important to consider that uh, we're running a deficit in the public safety projects, an area that the city staff to spend the remaining Measure T funds to cover our fire stations. I think it's more important to save lives by making sure we build these fire stations, provide a quicker response to families throughout San Jose, especially through uh, the hot summer. So we should be having in the future. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks to all of our members of our community for coming out to speak. All right, well, coming back to the council, I, I wanted to jump in here um, and sort of take uh, our staff back to 2017 and 2018 when uh, for those of you who were around in the conversation at the time, um, we're, I know, exploring a parks bond and then a bit belatedly got on this idea of what became Measure T, which was a sort of a public safety um, and other capital bond, you know, broadly, a lot of environmental purposes as well. And I can remember having conversations with members of the city manager's team. And at, at the time, I, I, for some reason, I recall Angel Rios being in one of the conversations, but um, and I can't remember if it was because he was a director at the time or, or 
our WC manager, but I, I recall raising the question, hey, you know, what would it take for us to get Alma Den and Cunningham open for recreational use, for swimming? Um, and I knew it was important to lots of families. And I, I can remember myself uh, competing in triathlons way back when, in, in, at that time in Almaden, and they discontinued the race, unfortunately. It was an enormous event. It was a, uh, attracted uh, top athletes, of which I was not one, but <laughs> we had amateurs like myself there, but we had pros from around the country and so forth competing. It was, it was a great event, but more importantly, it, every day it provided a great amenity for families to enjoy that was free uh, and safe. And I, I recall having these conversations because it was really interesting to me about this possibility if we had a capital bond of being able to create places for folks to swim. And I recall hearing a lot of description around cost and feasibility that made this a very, very heavy lift. And I wanna understand, have we done follow-up analyses since that make us believe that either Almaden or Cunningham, obviously Cunningham being the subject of this, uh, this um, uh, the, the memo that's uh, I know we're, we're, is about to be discussed. Th do we have a sense that there's uh, uh, we know we have uh, wrapped our arms around what the cost is, what the feasibility is, what the steps are, timeline, anything like that? Thank you for the question, Mayor. And Nicole Burnham from PRNS is also here to to help me answering these questions if needed. We have um, a uh, we. The last formal study we did of Lake Cunningham was back in 2010, water quality study. And um, actually, you know, we read it again today. It doesn't provide us a lot of great, it didn't provide us great solutions or cost estimates about how to clean this lake water. We actually have just initiated another study um, that is just actually the study kicked off last, last just is just kicking off and will be completed um, in March, roughly March, 2022. Um, that study is intended to provide us um, alternatives and cost estimates on what it would take um, to get clean lake water at Lake Cunningham. Um, and so again, by March, 2022, we should, we will have those cost estimates and alternatives in hand. Matt, I just want to jump in this is Nicole yeah. from PRNS, Deputy Director. Um, it's not clear to us that Cunningham is swimmable and that it will be in the future. Um, it, it's, it's a challenging, body of water without it in a couple of community members mentioned it with no inlet and no outlet it is a pretty stagnant water body it's basically stagnant groundwater that sits so while we think we can make it usable for boating recreation and surface recreation it's not clear to us that it, it can be made swimmable again so i just i feel like it's important to articulate that yeah. and be clear I, I recall having that conversation about three or four years ago and not fully understanding what the barriers were because at one point it was swimmable, <laughs> um, but there's no inlet or no outlet. And so I'm wondering why was it swimmable deck, you know, three decades ago, but not now, what, what's changed? Yeah, and I think that's one of the questions we need to answer um, with the study that we have ongoing right now. Um, I think the bacteria levels have changed and, um, and the type of bacteria that we have. But again, I think we need to do a little bit more analysis before we know that for sure. But I, I want, it's important to me to just make sure we don't, we set an appropriate expectation. I don't want people to, to be thinking like, oh, it's gonna be swimmable in a year because it's just not clear to us yet that that's gonna be viable. And presumably we'd have to create an outlet, I would assume, right, to make this water safe in some way so that the, the water would actually not be stagnant and sitting. Is, is that fair to say? I think there's different options. Um, that, that is one for sure. Um, but getting fresh water in, you know, we've looked at pumping groundwater um, from adjacent wells to, to, to bring fresh water in. Um, so I, I think there's various options. The other thing is we do, we are having a lot of significant problems with shoreline erosion here. Um, and so that's another thing we need to look at is how do we, how do we manage the shoreline erosion, which is also maybe impacting water quality. And then just the proximity of geese, the amount of grass in immediate proximity to the water body um, attracts geese. And then geese, when it rains, runoff of their waste ends up in the lake. And so there's a lot of things contributing here that we, we, we're gonna kind of take a look at and see what we can do. 
Now, theoretically, a source could couldn't it be purple pipe or with perhaps some treatment to reduce salinity? Would, could that be a viable source if we were to try to make this safe? I think um, I didn't. I need to ask ESD that question. I don't. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if Matt does. I. I hadn't thought about it, and I don't know what proximity purple pipe is to the site, but I think it's something we can we can look at. Okay. So at this point, we don't even have a back in the envelope range of costs. Is that is that fair? Correct. We do not. Correct. But I'm assuming that number is somewhere in the eight figure range, not seven. It's, you know, it's, it's tough to tell. And as Nicole said, um, making it, um, if it's you know, making it um, clean for boating, maybe a smaller number. Um, okay. And so it's, it's, we really, we were, I, we were looking through the old reports today to see if there was any number that the old reports had that would really lead us to a better answer for this tonight. And, and yeah. we don't really have one yet. Okay, I guess I just say this. I, I appreciate the intention of the memorandum. And I, I would be happy to support going forward with dedicating money to Cunningham as soon as we know what we're shooting at. And I, I think by that, I mean, we need to be really clear about what our objective is. Are we going to try to make this safe for swimming or is this just going to be for boating? If it's for boating, is it worth I mean, I, obviously that, that restricts the usability considerably, I think for an awful lot of families. Um, and so I think we'd wanna know that really clearly and what's feasible, what's not, and for how much money. And, and certainly, you know, we'll have another November election. I'm guessing we're gonna need it anyway, cause we're not gonna have enough money to do whatever we'd wanna do anyway. We're gonna probably need to have some other capital source. Um, so it would just be helpful for us to at least get our arms around an estimate of cost, a sense of the feasibility, what is it we're trying to accomplish and achieve, and I will be all on board with putting money there. And I'm happy to say for now we'll put it in reserve and make this the you know the top alternative um, until we can at least get information. I'm just not eager to go jump in that direction when we don't not know yet what we're jumping into. Um, and so I appreciate very much the strong sentiment from the community because this was something I was very passionate about, you know, four or five years ago when we were talking about a capital measure and what the opportunities might be. And I'd be very excited about talking about it again and seeing, you know, if we can't get it done with, I think, what will be a relatively small amount of savings here for Measure T, then how can we get it done uh, with what will likely be a larger capital cost, um, either through another measure or another source, um, perhaps with some help from the state or the feds. I, I just think what we really need is some clarity around goals, costs, and strategy. Um, so I appreciate very much the intention of the memorandum. I, I'd like to see some hedge of sorts before we decide we're all in on this, just so we have enough time to get staff to get us answers to some of those really basic questions that I think the community deserves and that we deserve, because there are a lot of trade-offs here. There are, you know, other investments that deliver a significant amount of safety, of environmental uh, benefit to communities that critically need those benefits. Um, and so I just think we ought to have a little more information before we pull a trigger here. So anyway, I, uh, with that, I'll, I'll seed. Uh, Council Member Esparza. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I'll be quick. I know we have a time crunch. So I actually just wanted to ask a couple of questions. Is Chief Safian on the call or on the Zoom? I'm here. Oh, okay. Thank you, Chief. So um, I, I just wanted to, I'll keep it super brief. I just want to take a couple minutes and talk about the fire stations, um, which is very, very exciting. Um, I know station 37 is not in district seven. I'm still excited about it. Um, <laughs> And I'm obviously excited about the others. Um, I, I did want to talk about our staffing levels, though. So what is our current fire um, staffing level? So by staffing level, you mean total on duty or um, how do you sure. want to place? Yeah. Uh, so uh, daily, we staff 186 personnel uh, as a minimum. 
And, um, and so I wanted to get at the staff. So then um, in terms of that staffing now, and then how many retirements do we expect over the next five years? Um, the, the actual employee behavior in terms of when they retire is, is tough to predict. I think uh, I would say from a, a two year outlook, uh, we're, we're looking at about 120 personnel who will be eligible uh, for retirement. Um, and I think going uh, to the five-year outlook, I haven't done the, the exact study because it gets a little complicated uh, because I have to look at everyone's age as well. Um, but I would easily say that that number uh, doubles or more than doubles. So we're probably looking at 200, 250 personnel who may be retirement eligible. Okay, and then um, I wanted to ask about how many academies do we have, um, uh, do we have a year? And how many people are in each academy? So we're budgeted uh, to uh, have, hold two academies per year. And right now our bandwidth is 25 per academy. So it's uh, 50 per uh, fiscal year. So 50 firefighters, if everybody graduates, um, right? So 50 firefighters a year and 120 retired. Um, and so I'm just gonna ask this question um, and, then, and then make a couple comments. And, uh, but I wanted to ask if we did a hire ahead as we do with PD, how would that work in the fire department? How could you make that work? So I'll add another uh, challenge uh, to the, the math that you're, you're jotting, uh, which is we are uh, looking to open Station 37 uh, and then in a couple of years, Station 32 and then another out year for Station 36. So those are 14 personnel per station. Uh, and so I would add that to that uh, attrition factor. Um, so uh, to answer your question about a higher ahead concept, uh, I would have to do a couple things. One, I think we would need to budget uh, an amount to equate to an additional academy. And then two, I would need to figure out how to achieve it. Right now, I think I have on the calendar the ability to get through uh, two and a half academies if I squeezed it really, really tight. Uh, if I were to try to get uh, greater bandwidth, which I am pursuing right now, I would be looking at other alternatives uh, such as joint academies with other outside agencies, uh, possibly working with uh, a local uh, educational institution that puts on firefighter academies and maybe leveraging that relationship to increase our bandwidth. But we are just by way of our, our facility uh, and the way our academies are structured, uh, it, it, it's, it's difficult to add a, a large number of bodies to each academy. And, and that's in part because it takes, it takes staff to run an academy, right? It, it takes staff and it takes facilities. And so yeah. um, it, it, would, it would take some logistics to, you know, very basic things start to be a challenge. Um, the, the, the training props, uh, the classroom space, the, the locker room, shower facilities, all those things, uh, because we operate in a, a very, on a, on a very tight calendar, there's not a lot of time for, um, for, losing time on logistics, right? Thank you. And right now also with our current staffing, we're doing mandatory, um, what do you call it? Mandatory staffing, right? If somebody calls in, then you have to stay if there's nobody to replace you. Is that correct? Right, for anyone who's, who's on vacation or, or gone for any other reason or during uh, high activity periods where we're sharing resources across the state, uh, in all of those circumstances, we maintain that minimum staffing level of, of 186, which requires uh, folks who are not scheduled uh, to come back and work overtime. Thank you, Chief. I, I, um, I know that Measure T is exciting. I'm one of them that's um, thrilled at Measure T. I just think I have some real concerns about how we as a city um, plan to staff address these staffing shortages 
Um, and uh, so that we can figure that out hopefully sooner rather than later. And I'll, I'll give an example of the kind of volume that we as a city deal with. Station 26 in District 7 uh, runs an average of 15 to 20 calls a day. All 10 fire stations in the city of Santa Clara run about 20 calls a day. So, um, we have a volume and a need that is unique and we need to make sure that we staff it. So I know that this is a Measure T presentation, so I'll leave this right here, but I do think that we need to address the higher ahead issue um, and our staffing shortages um, for the wonderful fire stations that we're building and that we need. That's it for me, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Reynes. Thank you, um, Mayor. Um, I, I, I wanna just thank all of our community members. They've been um, holding the line, um, I think since the beginning of our meeting. And so thank you for, for enduring with us and, uh, and for your commitment to Lake Cunningham and to uh, the water quality on the east side of this just beautiful gem. Um, so thank you everybody for, for your um, support. Um, I want to share that when I was, well, you know, I won't say the age, but this was some time ago, um, I actually had kayak lessons on Lake Cunningham, and uh, I was around, I think I was around 24 or something, and, uh, and I, I probably wouldn't have been, had a, an idea to, to get kayak lessons, except that a friend of mine had shared that um, um, this tidbit and uh, we both pursued it over at Evergreen. They had some recreation classes. And, and, and this is the kind of um, exposure that I hope that we can continue with, with our um, communities. It made me a, a continued lover of, of the environment. It, it uh, uh, continued to um, excite me to, to be outdoors and to love camping. And this is the type of, of gem that I hope will connect our students and our families and our children to the outdoors in a way, in a very meaningful way. But we have to make sure that we invest in the east side um, as much as we invest in other places. And so I, I, I want to uh, uh, thank uh, you. Mayor, for, for your leadership on um, ballot uh, measure T. I know there's a lot of work um, and um, you ha we had a lot of partners, but it took some leadership um, always to tax our residents. It, it, it takes some leadership to ask them to, to help pitch in. Um, and I'm really glad that they all did this. Um, I also wanna thank my uh, council colleagues, Carrasco and Cohen for, um, signing on to this memo. I know that, that Lake Cunningham is just as important to them as it is to all of the uh, speakers who you just heard um, a minute ago. Um, I, I do wanna remind um, our council that last year we did commit to ensuring that any overages in this area of um, environmental and flood protection category would fund a local water quality project. And this is, I think, the only other project because Almaden it has a um, partnership with the um, Valley Water um, to, to, to work with, with the quality of water over in, in that area. Um, I tried to start that conversation and um, I would love it if we can re, um, uh, we begin once again that conversation, um, Mayor, with Valley Water. I don't know that they would be interested in having an outlet um, because they don't like our water. They don't like the quality of our water. And so we're kind of stuck um, in, in terms of not having an outlet, but I'm more than happy to explore any options that we have. We've also been talking to San Jose State University and um, a wonderful professor out there that's willing to do some research and water quality monitoring um, using the students to collect samples. And uh, there's just a lot of investment as you've seen with our speakers. And so 
um, I know that I don't have to uh, convince you very much of uh, investing in Lake Cunningham. Um, but I do want to uh, um, remind everybody, and I don't think I have to, but I will, um, about equity in terms of where we spent money. And just for an idea on Measure T funding, I had asked this the last time this report came to tell us where are the projects that are being um, completed, how, what's the investment looks like, district specific. And there are um, uh, three districts, and I won't name them, but there's three districts that are uh, each receiving five projects in each respective district. There's two districts that are receiving four projects. And then, then there's um, one, two, three. Then there's four other project, four other districts that are only receiving two, and one district receiving only one. Um, and one of these uh, in our presentation, we saw the commitment of, of some of the community center improvements and Camden had $6 million. Um, and um, in one of, uh, in the, in contrast to having four community center improvements with a 2.7 total. And so when we take a look at where we are investing, um, we have to make sure that there's some equity involved. I know that there's different um, repair and improvement levels for each of those uh, um, community centers, um, but we also have to make, we have to ensure that there is some investment on the east side on a very intentional way. And so this is my uh, very intentional uh, way of ensuring that there is some Measure T funding in my district. And um, in my district, we only have two um, projects um, uh, that, that are going to be funded. Um, so, Mayor, I, I would like to um, offer a suggestion to maybe return to council with a plan for approval. Um, that brings forward the results of the of the current study, um, and then maybe a strategy. And um, once we take a look at that, um, uh, then decide what are those what path to take, and um, and a commitment not to spend expend any funds until we see uh, um, and have a work plan uh, uh, completed. And so um, I see you shaking your head. So I think. Yeah. That it's yeah, I would support that. I certainly understand why you set the money aside and let's come back and learn what we're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I know it's going to take a group effort. And so I hope that I can have your support as well as the support of my colleagues um, in uh, replenishing our, our uh, water quality. Uh, there's so many folks who enjoy uh, Lake Cunningham and I hope that I can invite all of you one day uh, so that you can take a look at our, our beautiful park, um, regardless of whether you can stick your finger in that water and, um, and not get uh, an infection. <laughs> um, so anyways, uh, I, I love the support. Thank you, uh, Mayor, uh, for, for your flexibility. And, um, and thank you, uh, everybody who's called in to support Lake Cunningham to make sure that there's some there's social justice and investment in um, our east side. And I'm going to quote Councilmember Carrasco, east side matters. So, so thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a couple of questions, Matt, the um, fire station 37, the report said it's 25% done. I'm so sorry. And, oh, I'm uh, sorry. So sorry, um, uh, Council Member Davis. I don't know if I made the motion formally. I know I added that piece. Can I make that motion to move my sure. memo and add the, the, the piece that uh, the um, the piece that I just uh, spoke of in terms of waiting for returning, returning to council with a plan for approval that brings forward the results of the current study and a strategy um, before any funds are expended. And I'll happily second it. <laughs> Thank you. I apologize about that. It's late. No problem. No problem. Um, so Matt, the I just want to make sure Fire Station 37 is on track for the January completion. Yes. Yes, it okay. is on track. 
I see the structure going up, but the 25% number kind of gave me pause. So I just wanted to make sure. Um, good. And then, and then I just wanted to ask also, um, Chief Sapien, my understanding from the budget was that we have funding for not only all the, everything that goes into the fire station for 37, but also for the staffing for Fire Station 37, which is sort of like the higher ahead program that uh, Council Member Esparza was alluding to. Is that, is my understanding correct there? Uh, you are correct. The 21-22 the operating budget does add 14 positions, which is the equivalent staffing of the entire Station 37. Uh, from a timing perspective, in terms of our ability to onboard, uh, we would be uh, completing the current academy in early September. I am working uh, with staff to see if we can start uh, another academy immediately following. Uh, I'll caution that we are currently uh, carrying uh, about 22 vacancies. And so uh, we would only be able to onboard partial uh, staffing to get to full staffing. Uh, Station 37 would have no trouble opening uh, and would not be delayed, but in order to catch up to the new, the new number uh, of total firefighters, which would be um, 719 in the next fiscal year, uh, it's gonna take us a couple academies to get there. Uh, and we're, we're working against uh, as, uh, as Council Member Esparza noted, uh, a pretty high expected attrition rate. So we're, we're gonna have to really work hard to, to onboard firefighters. Okay, so I just wanna make sure I heard you correctly. Fire Station 37, when it's completed in January 21, 20, January 2022, will be fully staffed. We, we will have uh, staffing to open the, the, staffing and a brand new fire engine, we're hoping. <laughs> yes. To get it open, yeah. Okay, so it will open in in late winter, early spring. Uh, as soon as uh, Matt hands me the keys, we're gonna get it rolling. <laughs> okay, great. And, Thank and you. Chancellor, I wanted to clarify. Staff just clarified that it's a forty five percent completion. So um, that may be a mistake in our memo. The twenty five. Thank you. I feel much better about that. <laughs> uh, and then I have one question, Matt, about the. Well, two questions about the LED street lights, specifically the street lights. <coughs> the report had a lower number of street lights that PG&E had completed than your presentation, which said 7,500. Still of 27,000, is that actually gonna happen by the end of the year or by January? Yeah, yes, they're, yeah, by January, they're, they're, uh, it's a, a few weeks behind. And so we actually had a lot of internal discussions on this the past few weeks, and we actually and stared at their Microsoft chart schedules. Um, a lot of the first half of the year, they did um, move forward really early with the zone one in January and February. But for the other, I think, five or so zones, the first part of the year was really spent on all the background contractual work and everything like that. And for each zone, once they start construction, it's about one and a half months of construction or field work. And so um, right now they're doing, and each month from here on for the rest of the year, they're starting another zone. Um, and so, yeah, we had a lot of internal discussions about that because if you just do the math, it doesn't extrapolate to being done by the end of right. the year. They are on track. Um, okay, that's, uh, that's helpful to know. And I've gotten a handful of emails about the brightness of the LED lights, which I'm sure you know. Um, they can be shining into, you know, residents' living rooms and bedrooms. Is there a discussion on potential solutions to that issue? And I know my staff's been working with DOT on that, but is there anything, I think Shani had talked about the color of the light and also the possibility of dimming with the smart controllers, which by the way is my next question, but what are their possible solutions? So other than the dimming, I would probably need some help answering that. I don't know if Rick or anybody else from DOT is available to help me out with that one. I'll see. I got Matt, Matt, John. Council, Council you know. Member John Risto, Director of Transportation. That that probably is the the answer is right now. The only thing we have were 
uh, addressing that that sort of thing is the controllers that we intend to install on many of the lights. So that's the our only answer at this point. Okay, so that brings me to my final question, which is, um, can you talk about why the controller procurement is on hold and how long it will be on hold for and how soon these can be installed? Is, will we prioritize the ones where we've gotten complaints or where they're, they're you know, near areas that don't have trees between the home and the the light, I mean, what are, what's the process for procurement and then installation? Sure, I'll start that and John may want, can help add um, to the answer. So we were working last March, 2020 um, on aggressively proceeding with the procurement, to get those smart controllers done in time for um, uh, pg &E to start installing them. And obviously a lot happened in March, 2020 and, um, and we couldn't proceed with that procurement. Everybody was, you know, Everybody was off to other things. Um, and so we, um, and right now we are focused on the pre procurement for the smart controllers for the city facilities lights. And we're seeing what technology comes out of that. There may be technology that comes in that procurement that DOT is interested in um, looking at for the smart controllers for the street lights. And so that's why we wanted to finish this um, procurement for the city facilities first. And it's later this summer, I think, uh, that will be done. And then get started and prioritizing the, the, the procurement for the smart control for the street lights. Um, and so we don't have a schedule for that yet. We need to work that out internally with the city manager's office of finance and prioritize the procurement. Um, and then regarding, you know, right now in measure T, we may, we, it's likely we won't have enough. We probably don't, we may not have enough money to do smart controls for all the street lights. And so we may need to prioritize and pick and you know, John, we haven't, gotten to the point where we've made any recommendations on how we would do that yet. So okay. we, we would have to come back to you um, with, with some proposals and options. Do we have a sense of how much that would be that would not be included in Measure T? I don't have that off the top of my head right now, but we do have some numbers we've been running so we can follow up with that, those numbers. Okay. Um, disappointing. I understand why we are where we are, but it's Obviously, it's not ideal. Thanks for letting me know, Matt. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Cohen? Yeah, thank you. Um, first, I want to just um, mention in the uh, Measure T memo, there's the talk of fire stations. Um, we have that important fire station 23 work that has to come someday in District 4. Um, I was actually just visiting the uh, firefighters in the tiny house where they <laughs> currently uh, live. Um, and so it's definitely important that we find a location. So I know that there's still a lot of work to do to, to figure out where that can go. Um, and so I want to make sure that everybody who's involved in trying to find a space engages with our office and we can try to work together and be creative about where we might be able to site something. And I, I like the idea about the mixed use location. There's a lot of possibilities, I think, on that corridor. Um, so let's, you know, let's engage on that. Um, the money that's in the budget for fire fire stations does include money set aside at this point for purchasing property and for the construction of that firehouse. Yes, council member, it does. Um, and as I was indicating earlier, uh, we, however, we are tracking over on our public safety um, reserve yeah. so far. And so um, I, we're, we're going to do this, but I am, I am worried. That's why I'm kind of trying to keep as many savings as the bank as I can. Okay. Yeah, I mean that definitely is an important need in that in that area. Um, you know, moving on to the the Lake Cunningham um, discussion, I, I I appreciate the uh, the comments by the mayor about you know what what's possible and how we'll figure out how to spend the money. I think it's a good idea to to consider this a set aside at this point and then figure out how that'll get spent when the studies come in. Um, you know, I, I think we have a couple of gems on each side. I didn't get a chance earlier today to to thank. The mayor and the council for um, putting money in to fix up some things at Allen Rock Park, our other east side gem, um, and, and we'll be celebrating the 150th anniversary there next year. So I'm excited that we have some money budgeted there. And I think that also getting some work done to, to fix up Lake Cunningham is, will be an important uh, addition. Um, I'm sure there are some technical solutions that will help us with that lake. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be an inlet outlet. It can be probably recirculation of some kind, but it would require, um, you know, some spending and some technology. 
Um, but I look forward to studies that say what would need to be done to get that water quality improved. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there's gotta be a way to do it. So I look forward to supporting the motion on the floor and uh, working with, also working with staff on, on finding a location and a solution for Fire Station 23. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Pross? Yeah, thank you. And um, I appreciate the, the commentary on this as well. And uh, we'll be supporting the motion. I, I just had a question and as we begin to, to dive into it, how we can help to revitalize um, Lake Cunningham. I am curious on some of the history and I, I don't expect staff to have the answers now, but as we dive into this and, and, and I think find out what it would cost and, and how we could make that usable. Um, I'd like to see if we can dig a little bit into um, the history as well, just to help educate the, the council. My, my understanding, and as we've heard tonight, that it's uh, artificial lake, um, right? No inlet, no outlet. Um, and I think much like anything else um, or any other uh, lake with, with no, no outlet like this uh, is gonna go through several different ecological stages uh, of its lifetime. Uh, and so I think that, um, I believe it was 1982, this was, this was opened. And so um, I'm just kind of curious what, you know, what the plans were back then, and maybe, maybe there weren't any or, or and what, what there have been over the last maybe couple decades um, to, you know, to actually keep the lake a, a usable body of water. And it sounds like you know, we're going to try to, to look into that now, what it will take to get it back there, but I would be more interested in what it would take to keep it there um, and, and how we actually maintain uh, a, a, a pretty large, you know, 50 acre body of artificial water that, that again, has no inlet, has no outlet, so it's not going to naturally um, circulate itself. And even as, as the mayor pointed out, I recall as well, um, not, not being in those, uh, triathlons, but actually working them as an EMT down in Almaden Lake. And, um, and then remember when, when, you know, they, they closed it off for that purpose. And, and, and that actually has an inlet and an outlet. And I think it was, you know, other factors that were causing that to, to clog up and not to necessarily circulate. And obviously, I think the other factor is human usage, right? <laughs> just, and, and, and what happens to, to lakes like that. But it, these are just, I think, natural phenomenons when you have anything like a stagnant body of water. And so I, I, I would love to see Lake Cunningham um, be a much more useful asset. But what I'm, again, what I'm really interested in, especially if we're gonna talk about a major investment, it would be how we keep it that way as well. You know, what, what, what would that take? What kind of investment? And, and again, a little bit of history when we, when we dive into this to understand how have we been maintaining it uh, or, or not maybe and what was, you know, what was kind of the plan as this was set out in 1982? Did we just maybe not know enough at that point or not, you know, not necessarily plan far enough ahead? Uh, either way, I'll, I'll support the motion and I look forward to, to that, that, uh, that dialogue going forward. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Foley. Thank you. Uh, I just have a couple of questions regarding uh, a couple of areas. Uh, first, I'm excited to see Station 37 as well. As soon as it's completed, then it will ease the pressure on surrounding fire stations. So I'm I'm excited to see that. Plus, it's only you know a mile or so from my house, so it'll ease the pressure in this general area. Uh, the southern part of Willow Glen. But Matt, I had some questions for you regarding the community centers. You have uh, in the memo, there's a prioritization of and grouping of how the community centers are going to be upgraded. And the, the first grouping is uh, Roosevelt, Mayfair, Bascom, and Seven Trees. But then Camden is next with the larger price tag of them all of six million. So why would Camden, can you can you walk through me why Camden would be higher in the priority list than the others? Sure, I'll start and then Nicole's gonna um, save me a little bit here too. The um, uh, Camden is is the department operational center for, for parks and rec during emergency too. So it serves a larger um, a citywide purpose um, for the department um, and for the city during major evacuations. And um, 
that's Nicole anything to add to that or is that also has the largest capacity mm -hmm. center so it has the largest sheltering capacity both for overnight sheltering and then also just the ability to serve people on a local mm -hmm. center um, so it, it's an important asset for us in in the system in terms of being able to shelter people um, and it also had the most need. I mean, it's just the most structurally deficient, right? It needs a new roof. It needs the memo outlines, um, a list of needs um, from new roof, ventilation, HVAC, um, seismic retrofitting needed to be done. Um, whereas the, the four that are listed in phase one really only need you know, the um, generator connection ability and some minor improvements, but Camden had a, had a longer list of, of items that were needed. I'm really surprised about the seismic retrofit that's necessary because it it doesn't seem like that old of a building. Well, there's a portion of it that's really old and a portion of it that's new, um, yeah. and so that's that's the problem with with Camden. The um, it, a lot of it was rebuilt and renovated as part of the measure P bond measure in the, in the mid 2000 or 10 12 years ago, but a, a significant portion of it was not renovated. Okay, so it's it, I got it. That makes sense. Yeah. It's the it's the older part of the building that yes. is need of the um, retrofitting. Mm -hmm. yes. And what is the timeline for these projects for the community centers? So that's so a great question, Councilmember. We have um, I'm gonna look in the back of the report. We have. Let's see if we put preliminary timelines for some of these. We are st we still need to flush th that out in more detail. And I'm actually going to ask uh, if Catherine has an answer for her to weigh in. Um, we're still we we need to report back to council. We don't we don't have uh, set timelines for these community center projects. Today's action was um, really to set those priorities um, and. Um, and make sure we're in line with council on which ones we're implementing. And, and very quickly here, though, we will start developing schedules. You're not going to have to wait six months until our next Measure T report. We'll be developing schedules over the next few months as the new fiscal year starts. Okay, great. Thank you. That that helps me with Measure T. But I have one more question regarding the community centers, and that is relation to cooling centers. Are we going to be opening those up this week? It's going to get really hot. So are we going to be opening up any of our community centers for cooling stations, cooling centers? Anybody know? I did see the notice come out today, but I have to say that I don't know, but I saw Lee just put on his um, video. So he might be aware of which ones are opening. Yep, we're going to be sending out an email to all the council offices to share social media. Um, sometime tomorrow morning, but we are organizing between a few different community centers and libraries throughout the city right now. Okay, great. Thank you. That's it for me. All right, Council Member Foley, I just wanted to add one more um, comment about the community centers. Uh, yes, Kathy Brown, Deputy Director. Um, for the priority one buildings, uh, we're planning to, to start the design actually this summer. And so it's about two years out. So just general time frame for you. So the, the list of uh, so the priority one grouping, that's Roosevelt, Mayfair, Bascom, Seven Trees. Yes, correct. They're the first round. They would be the first round and then Camden would follow. Okay, good. All right. Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Just to complete the first round of council comments, uh, Councilmember Mayhan. Thanks, Mayor. I'll, I'll be very quick. Uh, first, let me just thank staff. Really appreciate all the great work on all of these Measure T projects. I um, co-chaired the campaign and knocked on a lot of doors back in the day and really appreciate all the work you guys have done to maintain the public trust that we actually delivered and are, and are delivering, you know, on schedule, on budget. But my only question um, is, is just about the bond issuance. Given the extremely low interest rate environment that we're in, does it make sense to potentially and I don't even know if we're allowed to do this, but if we are, would it make sense to pull forward and, and maybe issue more bonds at this time rather than delaying the, the last tranche to 2024? Um, thank you, Councilman, for that question. Actually, Julia Cooper is presenting the bond issuance next week um, at, at a city council okay. meeting. So I'll, if, if you can maybe I can hold say on the answer yeah. to that question and I'll let her know you asked. Yeah, thank, I can shoot her an email in the meantime, but thank sure. you. That, that sounds good. Okay, that was all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. So 
Um, interesting answer about why there's so much investment in one particular community center. Um, and Matt, can you restate, is, is it because you're, you're saying that this is the headquarters for PRNS when there's emergencies? Well, yeah, so a couple of things is, and Nicole maybe have given, given the best answer, um, that it is the Department Operational Center where it's located. It is a large center, allows to spread out, and um, it also has a significant capacity, um, as, as Nicole mentioned as well. Yeah, and, and I- But Nicole's and answer is the official answer for this one, if you want to correct anything I said, Nicole. No, no, I think you're right. I mean, the original building where the gymnasium is, which is the space we've used for shelter, it's actually been operating as a shelter for the for over a year um, and will be used this week as cooling center. It was built in 1955. Um, it needs a new roof. The roof is the largest expense. Um, that shelter can fit 850 people. Um, in terms of you know serving as a local assistance center or daytime capacity, it has an overnight sheltering capacity of 333 people. This is all in the memo, but it's a significant structure. There's a significant amount of space here, and it is our go-to space. I mean, it will be actually. I had um, some staff and and John Cicerelli um, have been texting me. So our cooling centers are going to be Camden and the Joyce Ellington Library that are going to be open tomorrow. It is, it is hands down the center we use most frequently for sheltering in the city. So what about the emergency operations center that has been awarded 54 million? Um, uh, I think it was, I think that was the amount. What, aren't we duplicating, aren't we duplicating um, efforts here if there's already a building for the EOC? No, that's a great question, council member, and, and I'll, I'll start and then Matt can, can jump in, but there's two different things. So there's the emergency operations center at a citywide level that strat that provides citywide strategy and direction um, to staff and all the departments, but PRNS and many departments, DOT included, have their own department operations center where we receive direction from the environment, um, the EOC, and then direct our staff. And PRNS is responsible for sheltering and driving sheltering. So we will always have a group of staff located in a, in a location, a central location, quarterbacking how we're gonna deliver cots, how we're gonna get you know, shelter and food and water to people um, when there's an emergency. That's similar, we, we saw it with the flood um, and that's it's just a critical part of what we do. And then if it's something like an earthquake, we will have also park operations staff that need to be out assessing buildings and structures. And so, so there's that, that overarching emergency operations center, but we have our department operations center. That's a critical link in the emergency response system for the city. Well, I, I don't know if that's actually in the center of San Jose, um, uh, closer to Campbell um, uh, for me. And I don't know, um, Anyways, I, I think that's a, a huge investment in in a community center that I don't know is in the center of the city of San Jose for the reasons and purposes that you just described right now, especially that we have an emergency operations center that's also getting built. So um, I, I'll leave it as is, but um, it it's concerning. I would love it if if your emergency operations center was in my district, so we could have that investment as well. Um, anyways, uh, thank you for for the answer. Mayor, I just want to see clarity on the um, direction. If yes. Yeah, so what what I what I heard, and I'll make sure what I what I heard on the the, the direction that's on the table is that. We keep the um, savings from the environmental protection category generically in the environmental protection category. And then we come back as staff with the results of the study and an analysis of Lake Cunningham for a future decision on for the mayor and council on whether to invest that money in Lake Cunningham. That's, that why, I, that's why I understood that we wouldn't spend the money. We'd keep it, uh, we'd keep it on hold until we could make that decision. Is, is that correct with the maker of the motion? Councilman Reyes? Yeah, so my memo, my memo still stands as is, and I just I did add the return to council with a plan for approval 
um, that brings forward the results of the current study and a, a work plan or a strategy um, that we can all discuss um, before any funds are expended. So yeah, absolutely. Councilman Reyes, I think though your, your memo actually directs an expenditure allocation. And, and so I thought that there was a bit of a, a modification in that direction that rather than directing it, we'd get the information first and then and then make that decision. Am I mistaken? Sure. I can I I'll go ahead and 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 um, I, I just want to continue to have a commitment from the council. Um, and I I do have that. Um, on um, as item number two, um, I just want to make sure that the the remaining funds are continue to be allocated to flood protection projects. Um, and so this is something that we've already approved last year in June. So I don't um, maybe it's not to maybe it's to allocate the remain the the funds once a plan has been approved. I, I, yeah, that's my understanding was that we, we'd get information and then we can make the decision to, to allocate. But in the meantime, we won't we won't spend the money on anything else. Sure. Well, I mean, number three could continue to stay there and we can just say direct the city manager to allocate all uh, to um, return to council with a plan for approval that brings forward the results um, and discuss the allocation of all remaining funds for blah, 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 the rest of that that sentence have to pull it up. that wouldn't we wouldn't we i would eliminate the allocate the allocation piece okay so i, I does that does that clarify for you matt yes it does thank you okay great thank you uh council member crosco thank you uh actually so thank you. I I, uh, I appreciate the direction in which uh, uh, the the memo was uh, modified uh, for for Lake Cunningham, and I appreciate the callers calling in. I know it's late. It's been a long day. A lot of very heavy issues, uh, and of course, you know, uh, I I've talked uh, in the past of uh, you know Lake Cunningham. When I don't go into Willow Glen, I use Lake Cunningham to. Uh, get some of my mental health exercise in and uh, you know in, in spite of the repairs that it needs it, it's a beautiful park and when I'm out there I see so many folks uh, using it um, it's a it's a it's a park that's um, highly utilized and highly appreciated by a very diverse group of folks uh, young and and young and younger uh, and uh, uh, I'll count, count myself in the young group. Uh, so I, uh, I appreciate anything that we can do to really uh, make sure that it's, uh, it's not as, uh, I think Council Member Adenas or, or someone that called and said it was stinky. It's a little stinky. Uh, so if we can do something to clean it up and make sure that it's, um, uh, it's uh, usable and it's safe uh, for our families, uh, I, I think we owe it to our residents. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't going to chime in because I think Council Member Adenas has done a great job. Um, but now I'm very concerned about just where this conversation went in terms of the community centers. And so, Matt, if we, Matt or Nicole, uh, I just need you to please uh, clarify a couple of things for me because, you know, uh, this past year during the pandemic, you know, we didn't just have to endure the pandemic. You know, I, I uh, you know, my team was very busy uh, informing people that they were going to be out of um, power even before PG&E uh, notified our residents. And then we had to go out and start notifying individuals in the event that they had to evacuate due to the wildfires. Um, and then of course we had those great, fantastic days where, uh, you know, aside from uh, the pandemic, we couldn't breathe because of the great quality air. Uh, so 
uh, you know, we, we're right up against the hills. There are only a few arteries that lead out of the east side. Uh, it makes it very difficult on any, on any normal given day to get out of the east side. Um, you know, and now with traffic, uh, you know, almost back to normal, uh, I'm driving my, my daughter to summer school and, uh, you know, it's as if the pandemic never happened, truly. It's, uh, really just, uh, it's just really interesting how everything is going back, but, um, I'm really concerned. And, and this is one of the things that the mayor, Mayor, what was it a couple of years ago, uh, we were addressing or trying to address the soft, what is it? What do we call it? Oh, soft, story. soft story buildings. So, the soft story, yes, the soft story buildings, it's still, but that hasn't been completely resolved. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I have a lot of those here. So I'm very, very, uh, I'm fascinated by what I just heard right now. So if you could help me uh, understand, as I'm looking at page 19 of the 31 page memo, table eight has the number, has the different community centers and the population density of, um, of those community centers, I'm assuming as, as they serve, it, would you explain to me what that means, the, the, the population density of those community centers so that I can truly understand what that means? Sure, sure. Um, I, I, can, I can explain that. We, um, we looked at each community center location and used GIS data and census data to evaluate the population within a one mile radius of the location. Um, <clears throat> we, we assume the service shed for our community centers is about a one mile radius from the center itself. Um, after that, people would find another location. It could be a Red Cross shelter. I mean, it's important to remember that the, the community centers aren't our only shelters opportunities in the city. So the Office of Emergency Management has an entire list of shelters where we have partner opportunities with school districts um, and other facilities. Um, but so for us, when we looked at the community centers, we looked at the one mile radius adjacent. So the population density is the percentage of population within the one mile radius. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was kind of, that's what I was fearing. Uh, because, uh, uh, okay. So Mayfair, which is second on the list, Roosevelt is the, mm -hmm. uh, the first, and, I, I, and I'm assuming May, uh, Roosevelt is the first only because of you're looking at the population of, uh, uh, or the percent of population below poverty level. That, that probably helped it rise all the way to the top. And so, uh, which is, you know, so it just doesn't matter whether it's first or second at that point. Uh, so I'm looking at Roosevelt and Mayfair and the, those two in particular and then you look, and then I look at seven trees and, and seven trees is a particular interest to me because I, I used to teach ESL and US citizenship courses at seven trees, by the way, uh, back when I was uh, too young to remember really. Uh, but, um, and, and I just look at the population just right adjacent to those areas. And I'm amazed at at that, de the density of those community centers. And then I look also immediately to the right, and then I look at the percent of population below poverty. And I I'll take Mayfair because I know it very, very well. And I think if in the event, God forbid, we were to have the big one hit, where would we, besides Mayfair, get the kind of assistance? And I've been asking this already since the moment that, by the way, that I walked into office. I was one of the first offices up on the 18th floor to go and visit uh, uh, our director. At that time, uh, he was only there very briefly, actually. And, and ask that question, where do, where do my residents go and get shelter and help translation services 
you know, how does this take place? And Mayfair, you know, if there were emergency uh, vehicles and emergency um, services, how do they get into that tiny little uh, dead end street? How do they make that U-turn? How do they get all the services that they need when it's, you know, in a cul-de-sac and it's densely populated, it's a tiny building. Uh, and so I'm going to ask that question again. And so I know that this needs to have a further discussion and needs to be vetted out. Uh, but I've been asking this question and I'm going to ask it again only because I think that it's timely and I think that it, it just happened to pop up now. And I still haven't gotten it. I don't have the plan. I don't have the keys to the community center. I don't have the keys to anything that's going to allow me. What if I get cut off? from Highway 101, and you guys don't get to us. How do I serve my residents in that Mayfair Community Center? Because I'm the one that's here, stuck on the east side, and you guys are over in Camden. Now I'm finding out that you're gonna be all the way at Camden dispatching from a very large community center and I'm going to be in a really tiny community center where it's already <laughs> densely populated. And there is no other place except maybe PAL where we're going to have to make makeshift uh, uh, tents and, uh, and uh, shanty towns. I, I, I want to plan. Mm -hmm. And, and I, think, um, I think it's a bigger question. I can give you a couple of nuggets right now, um, but I, it, for example, um, the city has a use agreement for the school across the street from Mayfair. So if we were going to activate Mayfair, we would have access, you know, I could see a scenario where we're using both sites and shuttling people in and out. And I think in the kind of emergency situation you're talking about, there's going to be fire and PD and public works and DOT staff activated managing the situation. And when I say that we have PRNS staff at Camden in a department operations center, that doesn't mean that that's where all our staff is located. That means that's where our hub of communications are going to be. That's where people like me and Avi and you know our division managers are going to be, and we have all our communications set up, and we're directing into the field where we need people to go. And I think you know I think pandemic was a great example of how PRNS can respond and pivot quickly and get to people where we need to find them. Um, and, I, and I think that would be true in any emergency. I think it was true in the flood, and I think it would be true in an earthquake um, in any other scenario. I think it's hard to lay out any, you know, with certainty, a specific plan for every circumstance, because there's so many different ways, especially in an earthquake, there's so many different ways that things that could affect where we can get to and where we can't. Um, but I, I'll leave it to Matt or, or Lee or someone better qualified than me to answer about the overall city plan. But that's just from the PRNS perspective, I, that would be my my take. Yeah, and this is Matt. Yeah, I didn't have anything to add right now other than to reiterate what Nicole said. We we definitely you know get our staff out to the field um, where they're needed during emergencies. Um, I know we at a James Lick as one of our facilities during the flood in 2017. And so it sounds like we definitely need to follow up with you on this council member because we're definitely listening to everything you're saying and, um, and need to provide kind of have a better conversation, have a conversation with you on this. So we'll definitely commit to doing that. Uh, yes, uh, so I, I'm going to uh, hold uh, your feet to the fire on this one because I've been asking for a plan. Um, uh, uh, not from you specifically, but I have been asking for a plan uh, repeatedly uh, to, to learn and to prepare our residents. Uh, when I first came in, I was told that, uh, you know, if, if and when the big one were to hit, uh, first five would suffer a great deal of, of uh, uh, property loss and, uh, due to the aging of our structures, uh, you know, uh, a, a lack of infrastructure uh, and and uh, a lack of a retrofit. And so uh, I, I'd like to know what the plan is. I, I've been interviewed by uh, staffers. 
Um, you know, I've been asked about different uh, alternatives, but I've never been given a plan. And I remember when Johnny Camus was on council, he used to ask the same thing. Do I, do I get the keys? Where are the keys? How do I get in? <laughs> you know, and, and we've never been given a comprehensive plan. This is the first time I've heard that you have an MOU with the, with the school across the way. Uh, but that's just that little corner. Um, how do I communicate with the rest of the residents, um, you know, over in the Alum Rock area? Where, where do they go? Um, or, or the folks even just directly across the street from my house, where do I tell them to go in, in the case of, a of a gas leakage or a power outage, or if, uh, if, you know, if the hills were starting to, you know, uh, rumble and crumble and, and start to fall, I mean, where would they go? Where do I send them? Uh, where would they find shelter? Do you have an MOU with uh, with uh, what used to be the National Hispanic University? I mean, do they go there? That's the next building over uh, next to me. That would seem like the most logical place. I don't know. I have no idea. And so these are a lot of questions now that I have um, that I'm really curious about. And, and like I said, uh, one thing is the pandemic we knew we were all, all sheltering in our own homes. The other thing was a power outage and a fire. We all were packing up our vans and we were just heading out to uh, potential uh, hotels or uh, motels. We were all learning things as we were going. But in the event of a massive earthquake where buildings might be crumbling in front of us, where do we go? I don't know. Councilman Carrasco. So yeah. Appreciate the urgency of this this question and issue. Um, we're we're fighting against the clock right now. Um, is there a mechanism by which we could return to this and still be able to get through our agenda tonight? Yeah, I, I'm done, Mayor. I just want uh, I want to I I just wanted to publicly and go on record because I've been asking for this from day one since I came on council and I've never gotten a plan. And now with the pandemic, hopefully behind us, we know that any emergency is a real emergency. Uh, it is uh, uh, not a sci-fi movie uh, that is, uh, that's never gonna happen. It'll happen. It's just a matter of when. And, uh, and we know that uh, the best chance of survival is going to be uh, preparedness. Otherwise, why would we invest in, uh, you know, why would we have past measure T? And, and in order for, poor people uh, or people living in underinvested uh, communities or communities who have been marginalized, uh, they're gonna have the poorest chance of surviving if we don't uh, map something out for them. So I, I wanna plan, I wanna be uh, folded into this plan so that I can prepare our residents uh, with whatever it is that they need uh, more than just uh, teaching them how to you know, slap on a Band-Aid or how to uh, you know, uh, get them a first aid kit. I wanna know where they're going to seek shelter, where they need to go and how they need to uh, access uh, our staff in the event of a, of a truly uh, life-threatening uh, 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 crisis. And so uh, just uh, like I said, for the record, I want a plan. Yeah, and I, if I could, Mayor, just quickly and council member, absolutely. I know that work, that work is underway. I, I know it got derailed. Um, but nonetheless, we need to get back on that work. Um, and so that's really the work coming out of the Office of Emergency Management, not, not at the department level, obviously. So, um, so noted and absolutely follow, we'll follow up. Thank you. Council Member Sparson. Mayor, I'll be quick. I uh, wanted to thank Council Member Carrasco for bringing this up. And I think we've learned so many lessons during the pandemic um, and with the VTA shooting and certainly with the situation in District 7 where we were looking at opening the possibility of opening up a shelter for the residents around the Angmar house. I, I think, you know, whether it's the big one or, or a similar situation, um, I, uh, this is something that we can do. I know Pre-pandemic, Ann Tran had met with my staff and um, 
you know, she had prepared plans for each council office. And, uh, but we've learned so many lessons since the pandemic. I think it's really timely. And I think it would benefit all of us to have those meetings again with the Office of Emergency Management um, so that we can uh, develop those plans further. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have several questions I'll simply ask, and uh, I had asked for maybe responses offline. I'm happy to talk, whether it's by email or, or phone call or whatever works for folks. So I'll, I'll just run down four quick questions in the interest of time. Um, one was uh, the um, great to see the great progress on all the light conversions. I, it looks like we're about halfway there. We're on the home stretch. I want to know if we're setting enough money aside for sufficient uh, number of uh, smart controllers and IoT related devices that we need on those, um, particularly on the street lights in particular. Um, secondly, be helpful to know what the gap is remaining on our police training center. I know we had about a, almost a $44 million budget. We had only $25 million left. I don't know how much the Charcot project may help with that or not, but it'd be helpful to know what the gap is. Third, on the 911 call center, you know, our, our dispatchers are about as essential as workers get. And um, I, I know we're we've got renovation of that in, in this uh, measure. Do, are, are, are those women and men gonna get windows somehow? <laughs> I, I, I don't know why, I just feel horrible about the fact that they're, they're in a really high stress environment and they have no access to a window. Uh, but anyway, I'd be interested in knowing what exactly is in this, the renovation and whether it will make the space hopefully more, for lack of a better term, human, um, and, and uh, given the enormous amount of stress that those, those individuals are under. Uh, and then finally on the GSI projects, love to have a broader conversation. Uh, it, it looks like a six, more than $6 billion set of projects if we were to get serious about doing this citywide. I'm just trying to understand what are we trying to accomplish with a very small amount of money. Um, there's a few million dollars. It's going to get a very small fraction of that done. Is, is this really worth the squeeze or should we be focusing this on some other environmental objective where we could get more benefit? Uh, I guess that's the question I'd raise. So anyway, those are questions I just wanted to pose. I'm happy to talk offline. So thank you, Matt, for shaking your head and I look forward to the conversation. Okay, uh, any other questions? Let's vote on the motion. Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, item 4.1 is an ordinance amending Title 16. Uh, is there a move approval? Question or a motion? There is a second. motion. Second. Member Foley, second from Council Member Davis. Uh, two members of the public have raised their hands. Mr. Soto? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I would really like to hear somebody explain to me the rationale between by uh, excising or putting in C or not C, D. Because it says, please articulate the rationale that supports the request for the exemption request in D. One report annually is just, is just for gaming rooms fall under the purview of vice. I would suggest that the request is irresponsible and inconsistent with the social, criminal, ethical issues that naturally flow this indulgence of chance and greed. One report from the chief is not unreasonable, considering the known fact that card rooms, by their nature, attract an element that falls under the jurisdiction of San Jose PD. So I would like somebody to please explain to me why this isn't. Thank you, uh, Blair. I was going to ask the exact same thing as Paul just did. Hi, this is Blair Beekman, uh, item part D. Uh, the police uh, chief no longer has to report on 
uh, the crime element of, of uh, card room situations each year or each report. Uh, he, there's two reports that are required. One is to report on crime issues, crime related issues, and one is to report on uh, uh, more procedural regulation, regulatory matters of the card room situation. Uh, I hope I explained that okay. Uh, you've eliminated the, the uh, crime report part of the process. And Paul and I are both asking, why is that? And could you explain that at this time? And uh, I guess that's about all. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, coming back to council. Um, and I think I see the chief here uh, and deputy chief. And I, I, I guess I just wanna follow up on the questions with a slightly different twist here. I, I think I understand why we're discontinuing the use of these reports because uh, what we're only measuring right now is crime that's happening on site uh, and it's not terribly interesting or relevant I think to most of us because we already have police officers there and um, there's a relatively low level of crime though obviously there's some but relatively low level crime on the side of, a, of, of the card clubs. What is most important, I think, to me, and I think to a lot of folks who are concerned about the impacts of gambling in our community is, uh, you know, what about the domestic violence, the child neglect, uh, the burglary, robbery, loan sharking, theft, all the other crimes that start in the police report with uh, the suspect uh, left the casino. <laughs> and then and then we know what happens after that. And I guess the question is, is there any meaningful way, uh, given whatever limitations we have in our databases of reports and so forth, where we could actually run a check on, you know, all the times that we see, a, a, you know, a card club uh, or whichever name casino happens to come up in a police board. So we could really understand about the real association that I think most of us are concerned about when we think about gambling and crime, which is what's happening out in the city, not, not what's happening exactly on the, on the parcels of land where the, the card club's located. Is that possible? <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council, uh, and uh, Mayor, thank you for uh, for the question. Deputy Chief Mata, Chief of Police here. I'm sorry. Um, and um, yeah, the the reports, as you mentioned, just uh, highlight the crimes that have occurred there on site, uh, which, like you mentioned, um, just give us that um, that picture. In terms of uh, crimes happening outside of the the car clubs and in the city. We have no mechanism uh, of tracking that other than reading the report, like as you mentioned. So there is no, there's nothing in the database that uh, we can search for. Um, during the last four or five years, we did not find any um, linkages um, through the data that we have or that we analyzed uh, to suggest that what we just mentioned. Um, we can certainly uh, look at. Um, and search for uh, key words in reports, uh, and then um, you know manually go go through those. Uh, but there is no automated way to um, to do that. So that'd be uh, an expensive manual exercise. Yes. Got it. Okay. Thanks, Chief. All right. Any other questions? All right. Let's vote then. Jimenez. Yes. Perales. Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Carrasco? Yes. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, uh, we're on to item 4.2, which is an ordinance regulating the sale, lease, transfer of firearms and firearms ammunition uh, in San Jose in retail stores. Uh, we do not have a presentation on this item, is that correct? We are going to go to the public. Um, and I guess before we, well, uh, I'll, I'll save my thanks for after the public uh, discussion. Mr. Soto? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor Paul Soto. Um, I appreciate the uh, the intention behind the law. Uh, we feel like 
when a tragedy has befallen us as one that did at the uh, VTA center, um, we, we want to do something in order to remedy, to rectify something that we can tangibly, concretely do that will make ourselves feel better with respect to what happened because we feel a sense of powerlessness, a sense of loss of control, uh, or we're disoriented. You know, we are all victims of what happened there, myself included. And so um, I would really like to get down to the causes and conditions of what really actually happened on site there. I think that we would benefit from knowing precisely. Thank you. Uh Jugaraj? Yes, sir, you got it. So um, I would like to thank you all for having me uh, here to, uh, tonight. And uh, I respectfully disagree with this memorandum. I feel like we need to address the issue of gun violence and we need to make sure that everyone in our community has the ability to be safe. But this recording of Firearm purchases and ammunition purchases takes a step beyond um, ensuring the mental health security of gun owners and allowing for the people to, you know, practice their rights uh, securely. I believe, like, we need to make sure that we address uh, suicide issues and uh, anger through mental health counseling that should be free for everyone to access and support everyone. Thank you. Uh, Don B. Yes, uh, you know, watching the press conferences and the vigil after the VTA tragedy, I felt like I was hearing something new from Gavin Newsom asking, what the hell are we doing? To Zoe Lofgren and the gentleman who's the head of the VTA's union, not only mourning the deaths, but quite properly blaming the deaths on our society's long failure to take sufficient action. So I support the gun store proposal, and I thank you very much for taking these steps in the right direction. Thank you, Don. Uh, Sarah Huff Brancaro, welcome. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, and thank you um, all for being here for um, such a late night. Uh, I am a citizen of San Jose, and I was born and raised here. Um, furthermore, I'm a mother of four children, which one that was 21 years old was shot, and you know he tragically succumbed to his injuries in uh, January 2020, making him the first homicide victim of the year. Um, these Sydney or Sydney order. City ordinance are such important steps in forging forward uh, to be proactive in pre the prevention of illegal guns entering our precious community, our city, our backyards. It helps address the issues of, of suicide by firearms, accidental shootings, and homicide by gun violence. And I also would like to express my humble gratitude for Mr. Mayor Licardo for his perseverance and leadership as he has shown gun safety in our uh, city. Um, for obvious reasons, this issue is very important to me, um, not just personally, but, um, but um, for our community as a whole. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, person with the phone number 4085. Hi, uh, thank you for your time. I'd like to go on record as opposing what I see is a wrong-headed and simplistic effort to solve the problem of gun violence. This is nothing more than another thinly veiled attempt to completely eliminate gun ownership and the constitutional right of law-abiding citizens to defend themselves. Tragedies like the one at the VTA to which you are attempting to respond will not be eliminated by this regulation. We have read in the news about multiple instances where good guys with guns defended other people under assault with their personal firearm and saved lives. Whatever police that we have that have not yet been defunded cannot respond to every incident like this in time, and there will be fewer private citizens with the means to defend themselves and others if this regulation passes. These regulations only serve to punish those gun owners who act responsibly. Cities like Chicago have restrictive gun laws 
and also out of control gun violence. Please spend your apparently copious free time working on fixing the revolving door justice system, gang violence. Thank you, sir. And no, we have not defunded our police. Uh, Rachel, welcome. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor and City Council, for your leadership on gun harm reduction. I am calling in support of the regulation, the sale and lease and transfer of firearms, firearms ammunition in San Jose at retail. I represent hundreds of San Jose volunteers, including many who sent messages of support to the council. At work, at school, at a festival, the list goes on and on. We are a community of guns violence survivors. I am aware and horrified of the daily toll gun violence has, has on our community and believe this epidemic will only be solved with a variety of approaches from our city. Thank you for, again for your leadership and your time on this important issue and I support this measure fully. Thank you. Blair? Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for this item. Uh, just a reminder that uh, to myself, uh, to work at the state level, and the federal level uh, in uh, interstate uh, gun trafficking issues, uh, that can accomplish a lot as well. And in fact, it can be a way to, uh, I'm interested in, in, in those ways of working to address the future of gun violence. Um, to quickly note uh, from, the, from the gambling item previously, it says the impact of card room gambling on uh, crime in the San Jose metropolitan area. So it's my guess that uh, the future of these sort of reports that this was you're supposed to offer can hopefully be amalgamated into the report. Uh, you have to have some sort of overview of overall uh, gambling and crime and uh, good luck in how you can do that. Thank you. Thank you, Sana. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, my name is Sana. I am a San Jose resident and I urge you to pass this ordinance. Um, no one policy will ever fix a problem as nuanced as gun violence in America, but this ordinance is a step in the right direction and to not take action when we have the opportunity to do so is frankly unacceptable. Gun safety should not be a pro or anti-gun issue. Everyone, including responsible gun owners, should want to keep our community safe and keep firearms out of the hands of people who could harm themselves or others, which is what this measure intends to do by requiring suicide prevention materials posted in gun stores and training employees to eliminate straw sales, which is when a person buys a gun for a prohibited purchaser. These are just basic common sense regulations that should be in place already. So please vote yes on this ordinance and also continue to take bold steps to address gun violence in San Jose. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Brian? Council and uh, Mr. Mayor, I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah. Thank you for working so hard. I, I totally agree with this. Um, a gun just takes away a, a soul of another human being so quickly. There's no thought in it. Um, there are responsible owners, probably more so than not. Most guns that are used in crimes do come from, or a larger group of them, come from being stolen from owners who and sold in various ways. And I know criminals will always use guns, but drying up the source, eventually it's a heart matter. Our, our species has to learn to change or we're not gonna make it. Because we have weapons now that can end this world. And it's something we, I don't know, I don't have children, but I wanna see everybody who does have children to continue on, I really do. I have a pretty stock interest in the human race. So thank you for, I hope this passes. Thank you, Ryan. Eric, welcome. Hello, and thank you. My name is uh, Reverend Eric Swanson. I'm a pastor in Saratoga uh, and um, a community member in San Jose. And I want to encourage you to vote yes on this. I was doing some research. And as of May 31st, there have been, there were 247 mass shootings, 283 dead. 1,005 people injured across the United States, VTA, uh, we all know about that. But each one of those lives is damaged and each one of those families is damaged and each one of those communities is damaged. And whenever something comes up like this as really common sense uh, legislation, people will argue, everyone says, we don't have to do something, you know, not this. We have to do something, but not this. 
it's time to do something and I appreciate and applaud you for doing something. Uh, we need much better oversight of points of entrance of firearms into the public sector. This is one of the ways to help that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, thank you to the many members of the community who spoke this evening and I think many who waited to speak, who, who, uh, who had to get on with their lives and probably get to bed for work tomorrow. Um, appreciate everyone's patience, uh, not just tonight, but I think for what's well, been quite a time to get to this point, uh, because I think I look back at the memo uh, Vice Mayor Jones and I signed back in February of 2019. That was um, more than two years ago. Uh, and I know there was some reference that this had something to do with the VTA shooting. It did not. This is something that we had been working on with members of the community and several organizations uh, really focused on trying to reduce access, uh, unlawful access to firearms. Uh, we know that significant number of crooks get firearms and gangs get firearms through straw purchasing. They get people who have clean backgrounds to go purchase guns for them. Um, they may download guns, get guns, um, those guns and others that are not serialized uh, and try to purchase them in, in various ways uh, in the black market at homes uh, rather than in stores. So uh, this set of ordinances was really focused on narrowing the flow of guns to those uh, which are clearly legal and uh, hopefully doing something to deter the flow of guns um, that should not be lawful that are unlawful to own, uh, that is to persons who are not uh, legally uh, entitled to own guns because of prior convictions or other reasons. So uh, I really appreciate everyone's work on this, um, particularly Nora Freeman and Carl Mitchell. I know Carl had been working on this for a while. We got obviously sidetracked through the pandemic and I'm grateful that we got this to the council this month. Really wanna thank uh, the many community members uh, Many members from Moms Man Action. I think we heard from Rachel Michelson this evening and really grateful for all of uh, the work uh, of, of Moms Man Action. And there's really a, uh, several individuals that have been working hard on these and other reforms. Uh, Jessica Blitchcock, Blitch, Blitchcock um, uh, forgive me, Jessica, for mispronouncing your name. Leah Elkins, I think I do that every time, Jessica. Anyway, Leah Elkins, um, Teresa Fiss, uh, Sharon uh, Jenkin, Jess, uh, uh, and um, yes. So anyway, all of the folks at Moms Man Action, we appreciate uh, grassroots efforts to try to uh, push for more sensible gun laws. Uh, I wanna thank Reverend Eric Swanson, uh, who is uh, heads up PACS Firearm Safety Committee and is a pastor, as he mentioned over at West Hope, I'm grateful for his leadership. Uh, I want to thank our partners at the DA's office, Marissa McCune and Chris Ariola and James Gibbon Shapiro. Um, over at Every Town, uh, Katie Duda, uh, Paul John, Mike Mead, uh, very important organization for us nationally. And then, of course, at Brady, uh, Sheikha Hamilton, and at the Giffords Law Center, Allison Anderman, who's been invaluable in providing legal advice on this and other measures. Uh, and uh, finally, Lorene Jacobs, uh, who retired. Uh, from every town, but we're grateful for uh, her work with PAC uh, and every town. And I really want to thank Chris Rattana and Paul Pereira on our team uh, for their hard work over uh, many months uh, in the community and helping us push forward these initiatives. Uh, more recently, Christina Gumera, who joined the team, uh, really appreciate what Chris and Paul have done uh, and happy to be at this point. So thank you to Vice Mayor Jones and uh, colleagues have been working with in our Brown Act, uh, council members um, um, Carrasco uh, and Perales, and uh, I guess more recently now, council member Cohen. I appreciate everyone's uh, contributions uh, and support. Uh, council member Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first, I just want to say I really hate violence and I can't even watch uh, realistic violent movies and shows anymore, um, which is something I actually used to enjoy in my teens before my prefrontal cortex was fully formed. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I just really hate it. And um, so I always think about that when we're talking about this kind of stuff. And, and of course, even though this is something that we talked about in 2019, um, 
can't help but think about what happened at the BTA and my heart goes out to to all those families and, and every family that's been affected by gun violence, whether it was um, whether it was a self-inflicted suicide or, or, or someone, you know, being shot by either a stranger or a loved one, which is actually um, from what I've read about be the most prevalent forms of, of gun violence. Um, and, and it's because guns are so prevalent in the United States. We have more guns per capita than we are more guns than we have people in the United States which is crazy to me, but I actually have relatives who have quite a few guns, so it's not that surprising. Um, I think we absolutely need common sense laws um, that will reduce gun violence in our city, in our state, and more importantly, or most importantly, in our, in our entire country. I, many of you already know this, I grew up in a family that, um, and in, in a place where guns were respected as a tool, mostly for hunting and, and also for um, home and land protection. So I feel like I'm kind of in the middle of, of this issue and it's, it's a tough place to be in the middle because the issue has gotten so much more polarized over the last decade, decade and a half. But I'm, I just can't, from everything I've learned and know and I've, I know council member Perales has handled guns way more often than I have and has much more experience with them. I just have a basic pistol safety course under my belt. Um, but I'm not going to automatically support every proposal that purports to prevent or reduce gun violence. And I'm not going to automatically oppose it either, uh, which makes me a friend to no one and, and popular with no one. So I totally understand that. I did support the safe storage that, that came out and, um, I, I obviously can automatically support having the suicide prevention and the um, domestic violence prevention information in, in anywhere uh, guns are sold. But I have some, some other questions about other parts of this proposal. Um, so first of all, of course, the first thing that, that comes to mind, Nora, is, is the, the threat of litigation. And again, this is because, not because I think this is um, not, not legal or that you haven't done the work, but I would like to hear from you, you know, if, and when this is brought to litigation, what, what are our chances of, of winning this litigation? Thanks for the question, council member. We, um, we worked on this obviously for quite some time and, um, part of the, part of that time was, um, trying to make sure that we would have an ordinance that was defensible. And we think we do. Um, does it mean we're not gonna get sued? No, not necessarily. You know, this issue is, is, a, is an issue that um, is, these types of laws are challenged often, but, um, but we think we've threaded the needle on this and, and what we're bringing forward is, is defensible. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And I don't think being sued is automatically a disqualifier. I just had to ask the question um, because it is, it is an issue that is so polarizing that we know whatever we do, there's, there's likely to be litigation. Um, and I hadn't heard from you about that yet. Um, and then the other question for you, Nora, is, um, is this, is this ordinance redundant with state and federal laws that already exist? There, um, we were trying to not be um, redundant and we were also trying to um, avoid being preempted. So um, it, it, we may be consistent, but we don't think we're redundant. Okay, and if we're consistent and those laws change, how does that work? Um, does that, that mean it, you well, it, it would depend if if um, if it's an area that's within the state or federal jurisdiction, then um, we might be preempted. But I don't know that that's going to happen with this. If the law changes because there's a new interpretation 
of um, the existing uh, constitutional determinations, th those decisions to date, um, then there might be a challenge based on that. Okay, thank you. Um, and then for, for the, well, I guess this isn't a question maybe for you, Nora. I, I saw that there was a change to the licensing that they're all retailers are included. And I just wanted to know, are there sellers in San Jose now who aren't licensed, who will have to be licensed? There was a, there was a um, distinction between concealable weapons and long guns. And I'm just, I don't know if we have any re retailers who like specialize in hunting rifles versus, it looks like the chief might know the answer to this. I was gonna say, I think I think uh, PD has that answer. Yes, chief has it. Yeah, thank you, Council Member. Um, um, I don't have the answer, but uh, someone from my staff uh, does, uh, Lieutenant Kidwell of the uh, permits unit, he can uh, speak on that. Uh, since okay. he conducted outreach. Uh, with uh, some of the dealers here in the San Jose. Thank you. Jason. Council member, we have uh, for federal firearms licenses, there are uh, 10 individuals who actually have those licenses, but that also includes gunsmiths. Uh, so we have identified eight uh, retailers that already have the gun permits and would be required to have uh, the gun dealer license under this. So we believe that all uh, gun dealers already are permitted. Okay, thank you. So it's not it's not really um, new because we already had a firearms business license before, and they already all all had that. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And then um, I think this question would be for you, Lieutenant. What would be the cost to retailers in your outreach? Kind of what did they say? I know you and I had talked about this a little bit this morning um, about whether they have this, you know, this technology already versus not. So working with Carl, you know, we talked a lot about uh, most of these stores have video surveillance already uh, in their systems. A lot of times the insurance requires it uh, in these stores. The added piece is the audio and it's specifically just for the purchase uh, time and reviewing over the straw purchase, making sure that they understand what a straw purchase is and that it's illegal and it violates the crime. So uh, they're not expected to be audio recording the entire time, everyone's conversation. It's only for that particular portion of the conversation and retaining that for 30 days. And the 30 days uh, period we felt was reasonable and was in standard line with like uh, the regulations we have with cannabis rather than doing a longer period of time. So does that mean the audio and the video don't have to be the same equipment? So it could be your regular video surveillance and then the audio could be like an add-on? Yeah, it, we, it's a little more vague to allow them to be able to uh, customize their system. We okay. didn't want to make it so restrictive uh, that it became cost prohibitive. Uh, so there is, you know, the video part has a lot of the surveillance part of back room, shelving, other areas like that. And so in conversation with one retailer, you know, it's, they could also add in the audio portion just for one particular area where they're gonna be doing those transactions uh, to capture that audio. Okay. And then in terms of the, um, the straw purchasing training, is that something that we're going to be getting that material from the, um, the federal government, the ATF, or, or is that material that we're gonna be like, do we provide it to them? Do they have to get it themselves? Are we coming up with that ourselves? Or are we getting it from the ATF? Uh, the questions themselves are uh, actually already asked on the firearms transaction form that the ATF form has. Uh, in terms of uh, what we would like to see them ask, we can uh, provide them. We're going to be working with Carl Mitchell on um, some guidance on what we want to provide them as an example of what we expect uh, them to cover during that conversation. So questions about straw purchasing are already required in under federal law? On the, question, on the uh, ATF form for the uh, firearm transaction, uh, there is a question regarding that. Okay, thank you. So do we know how many, how many straw purchasers or what the statistics are for San Jose? 
on straw purchasing? I don't have that information. Okay. Thank you. And then my final question, I, I see that I'm over, Mayor. I just have one final question, which is the, the cost to enforce this new ordinance. Do we know what that is? Uh, we do. They uh, renew annually and we do inspections annually. So that will just be a part of uh, the checklist of making sure that uh, they're in compliance with these regulations. So this is going to be incorporated in your normal course of work? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. And Councilor Davis, I could just offer uh, Lisa an answer. It doesn't directly answer San Jose specifically, but nationally, the estimate uh, based on surveys is about 30,000 attempted straw purchases every year from gun stores. Now, that's not 30,000 guns. That's actually many more guns because those are often organizations that are gun trafficking organizations that are committing the, the straw purchasing to get multiple guns out into the, into the market. Yeah, I was just wondering specifically for San Jose. Yeah. I if this was, that's what, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a more specific answer. Uh, Councilmember Mahan. Thanks, Mayor. And I'm gonna apologize. My internet connection seems to be unstable. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I'll just say, you know, I appreciate uh, Mayor Ricardo, your Vice Mayor Jones, uh, and uh, you named a lot of people uh, or at the top there, but I you know, appreciate your collective efforts to try to address gun violence in our community, which is obviously something I know we've, we've all been reflecting on a lot in recent weeks and appreciate Councilmember Davis's comments um, kind of across the board. Um, you know, I, I also grew up, I grew up in a rural area, where, so I, I do sort of understand both you know, the, the kind of competing views and, and cultures around gun ownership um, and appreciate the attempt to try to reduce illegal gun ownership. Um, you know, I have to admit, I was surprised by the number of concerns and the outreach I got from gun owners in my district, uh, from people who hunt to, uh, believe it or not, little old ladies at the southern end of Almaden Valley who uh, don't feel real safe with, uh, you know, police response times being what they are way out there. Um, I think a lot of the concern was around the insurance proposal, which I know is not before us tonight, but I, I did also get a lot of questions about straw purchases and especially around privacy, which I want to talk a little bit about. Councilmember Davis asked a lot of the questions I had, so I appreciate that. Um, and I know I'm not in, in the Mayor's Brown Act group, so I haven't uh, had a chance to ask as many of these questions as I'd like. So we, just to confirm, we, we know nationally, we believe there are about 30,000 straw purchases, but we, we really don't know for San Jose what that figure is. Is that right? Councilor Mayhem, you, you asking me or, or the- uh, uh, I'm not sure who I should direct it to, yeah. Mayor. Yeah, probably. I don't, yeah. I don't think we were able to have a, have a chief, did, did you? Oh, yeah, uh, you're right, Mayor. We don't have that, that data or that information. Okay. And, and then I, my sense is, and I, I, forgive me, I'm not, I don't have a lot of expertise in this area, but it sounds like we're, we're kind of innovating here. Are there other cities that have adopted these video audio requirements? And do, do we have any evidence thus far? I understand if we don't, but do we have any evidence that, especially with only holding the content for 30 days, that that's going to be likely to have any impact on straw purchases? And again, I'd be happy to answer if, if you want me to respond, Councilman Mahan. Yeah, sorry, I'll try to direct my questions. Sure, Mayor, unless uh, the Chief has insight into that, but yeah, please. I, um, yeah, so we, there are a very small number of cities that have attempted this. And, um, you know, bluntly, we are trying to lead an effort to bring other cities and hopefully the state along. That's generally my experience with lots of, um, with lots of, innovative efforts we've led, for example, banning plastic bags. I think we're the largest city in the country to do that. And eventually we got the state to do it. Um, you know, various uh, different measures often crop up at the local level, uh, but it requires large cities to basically take that first step. So there are a small number of cities that have done this so far. Uh, I don't know of any data that would clearly prove straw. It's very difficult to prove a negative, right? As you know, <laughs> to prove that a straw purchase didn't happen because of this, that would have otherwise happened. So we're dealing in a world of illicit transactions that are very, very difficult to get data about. 
for all the reasons why it's difficult to get data about anything that's happening in a black market. Yeah, that's that's fair. I, I guess the evidence would be examples of cities using the the video audio recordings to catch people who have made straw purchases, but we're not. Sounds like we're probably not aware of that at this time. I I, I am not aware. I have not been doing the research uh, in the last few weeks. We've been pretty busy. Um, when we introduced this uh, back in 2019. At that point, there was not any data. I don't know what data has been collected since that time. Okay. Uh, well, I yeah, I'm asking. I'm going down this line of questioning in part because uh, I heard from a number of residents who have privacy concerns, which I think we're going to get on any kind of surveillance, uh, however well intentioned, just in the world that we live in today. So I, maybe there's a question for Nora, but um, so positing that we have residents who uh, own guns, buy guns, and are, feel that this is a risk to their privacy. Are we doing anything in the ordinance to ensure that gun shop owners secure that, that, that extra data they're collecting on people? Um, that can be part of what um, would be uh, worked out with the um, police department in our office in terms of how that data is held. It is for a very short period of time. Um, as I understand it, and, and uh, uh, Lieutenant may um, have more information, but as I understand it, most of these um, retail outlets have all sorts of video anyway. This is an additional um, piece um, th with a short retention period on a specific, for a specific issue. Okay, and it's the retention piece that's new or it's the, and the audio, I guess? Yes. I see. Okay. And the, the short retention probably may, I mean, I guess what I was getting at earlier is it may undermine the efficacy of the policy that I guess it's a little better from a privacy standpoint. Um, okay. Councilor Davis asked a lot of my questions. I'm sorry. I'm going through my list. Just haven't had the opportunity to under, fully understand this. Um, we talked about enforcement capacity. Um, one other thing I'll just bring up related to, to legal risk of this, you know, whether or not this will ultimately be upheld in the courts. So my understanding, and again, just cursory research, so apologies for that, but I believe a federal firearms license allows vendors to sell guns from their residents. And I don't know if someone can confirm that. I, I guess colloquially, these are called kitchen table FFLs. And if that's true, does, does this ordinance take that into account or does that become a basis for, for is that a risk for uh, the kind of legal viability of this ordinance? Lieutenant, do you want to take that question? Sure, you Council Member. So uh, for uh, one of these dealers to receive a state license, they also have to comply with local ordinances. And so that's where that bar gets set to where uh, we're regulating where those transactions can occur. So a local ordinance would take precedent over what's allowed with a federal firearms license? For a state uh for a state license to be issued, so for someone to be able to sell firearms in the state of California, they have, a have, have to have a fire, federal firearms license, but they also have to be in compliance with any uh, local ordinance that the city has. And so they wouldn't be able to uh, have a transaction unless they're in compliance with our local ordinance. Okay, okay. I, think I, I think I'm following what you're saying there. Okay, well, um, thanks. I, I appreciate the the kind of initial answers there and I know others want to speak so I'm going to I'm going to stop there. Thanks mayor. Uh thank you. And I, I'm just trying to pull up some answers to your questions that are important. Councilor Man, um looking at Gifford's Law Center, uh they, they cite some data saying the video taping sales does deter illegal activity at gun stores. Um Walmart, the nation's largest gun seller, began voluntarily videotaping gun sales in 2008. Uh, and in 2021, just this year, Illinois will become the first state in the nation to require that licensees operate a retail location videotape uh, in the areas of the business that include where guns are sold. So, so far, uh, five cities in California require videotaping of gun sales. Uh, and in their survey, 74% of Americans favor requiring retailers to tape all gun sales. 
Uh, but I think, as you know, they all have videotapes, videos running in, in the stores anyway. Uh, Councilmember Cohen. Yes, thank you. And I, I want to thank you, uh, Mayor, for your leadership over the years on this issue. Um, you know, obviously, this is an important issue and one that will, will bring a lot of debate um, to the forefront. Um, but I also want to make sure it's clear that this, what you've been doing here is not just a reaction to the shooting at the VTA. You've been thinking about these things and the city's been thinking about what we can do for a long time prior to that. Um, and as you so uh, eloquently um, explained at the press conference, um, I guess that was just last week, a couple of weeks ago, I can't keep track of time, but um, um, you know, we had something like eight straight days of incidents in San Jose of gun violence, even since that VTA shooting, even the days after that VTA shooting. So this is not, this is about the safety of our community and, and trying to find things that we can do in our community to um, reduce those numbers. And, you know, nobody will ever suggest that there's anything we can do to eliminate um, all incidents, but our goal is to make San Jose safer um, and be a, a model for what cities can do to um, make sure that guns don't fall into the wrong hands. The whole idea is to keep guns from getting from getting um, you know into the hands of people who shouldn't be buying them, or make sure that transactions are are legal and and uh, and not straw purchases. And you know, honestly, you know, the numbers in my mind, the question about how many there are in San Jose versus nationally. If there's 30,000 nationally, we can assume that they're, being, that they're happening in a lot of places. Even preventing one of these straw purchases from happening would be a success. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's one or 100 or 500, every one of those is a potential uh, victim at the end of that, you know, from that gun. Um, so, I'm, I'm, I'm excited that we're thinking of creative ideas here in San Jose, that we're not scared or shying away from this debate, um, that we're using the, the opportunity to try new things that will hopefully help make our community safer and that other um, jurisdictions around us will eventually adopt what we do um, and the state eventually will adopt what we do. That's, that's our goal here. Um, so again, thank you for your leadership. Thanks for everyone who's worked on it. I, I'm appreciative. Um, I want to make a motion to um, um, to approve the amendments to the ordinances um, as proposed in the memo. And um, I think that's it for my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, second with Vice Mayor uh, Councilmember Peralta. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And um, I will reiterate that comment from Councilmember Cohen, as I know this is uh, issues, these are issues that you have been pushing for a number of years, and this definitely was not just a response to uh, the VTA shooting, and uh, appreciated, I've appreciated being in the, the Brown Act and, and working on these issues with you over the years. Um, much like Councilmember Davis, I grew up amongst guns as well. My father and my grandfather owned them. Uh, both of them hunted recreationally. I took my first hunter's uh, firearm safety course when I was about 11 years old. Um, and although I didn't take too much to uh, hunting, I did not uh, enjoy that. Uh, I did, uh, and since then, uh, have enjoyed shooting guns for sport. And uh, as my colleagues know, uh, I was a police officer for eight years. I'm still a reserve officer here in San Jose. And, and today I own several guns, including handguns, shotguns, and rifles. Um, and, and still enjoy, uh, you know, recreational shooting as, as well. Uh, you know, I think in, in, in addition to, to that history, um, I have always welcomed a more restrictive gun industry. And I've, I've felt that way since I was uh, a child. And really, the, some of the lessons actually learned in that first uh, firearm safety course. And um, in, in growing older and learning about, I think, the, the industry itself and then comparing it to a number of other industries, um, it's, it's 
really baffled me as to how uh, this particular industry has um, been uh, in essence untouchable um, in many places throughout the country. And, um, and thus I have, have welcomed the opportunities here locally to try and push where we can. When you compare it and look at industries like the cannabis industry, which um, we have come, especially here in San Jose, have been an example on how to, to regulate uh, and have oversight over that industry very, very well. When you look at the gaming industry, an item that we had pop up today, and, and similarly, and you're talking about both of these industries with uh, robust uh, video and, and uh, audio oversight and, and, and tremendous regulation. You look at basic industries like the cigarette industry, and there was an item that we've deferred from tonight on flavored e-cigarettes. And, and really, there's just many things that you can, you can compare to where uh, we have taken to uh, what I would call common sense regulation and oversight. And um, comparatively, uh, that has not been the case with the firearms uh, or the gun industry. It is extremely uh, difficult to get certain um, licenses in, um, in this state or even in this country, things um, like cosmetology, uh, the process to get a cosmetology license uh, for instance, to do, you know, do someone's nails or cut their hair is very time consuming, very challenging, and many people fail. Um, and uh, conversely, um, the hurdles to purchase, uh, for instance, a semi-automatic um, firearm uh, are, are, are relatively non-existent, uh, very basic um, regulations to be able to, to go out and purchase uh, such, a, such a weapon. Um, you know, the, the course that I took was obviously because my, my grandfather and my father wanted to ensure that I knew how to handle firearms before I would go out uh, hunting with them. But uh, as, as, you know, people come of age here in this country, they're able to, to simply go out and purchase uh, a, a firearm and, and at times a very lethal one that, that um, that then would, would, would not really require them to have any bit of, of training or education um, and very little oversight. And uh, I think that that's been a, a, major, a major issue here in, in our country specifically. And I think the best example that, that I've seen in my life uh, was actually when I was able to, to travel to uh, Dublin, Ireland on a sister city trip. And uh, I, I had an interest to, to tour their police station and, and meet with some of their police officers and, um, and, and wanted to just get an understanding of how they policed their community and specifically their downtown uh, entertainment areas. And what was shocking to me and what was both shocking to the officers that I met with was the stark difference in how our, not only our countries, but also even our police departments and our police officers uh, viewed and, and utilized firearms. A, a, a basic police officer in Ireland does not even carry a handgun. Uh, it is a specialty tool that essentially you would compare it to maybe our SWAT officers or here in San Jose, as we call them merge officers. And uh, only in certain circumstances will these SWAT officers go and retrieve their guns from a locked, um, a locked uh, uh, cage within the police station when they need them. Uh, but on a regular basis, their officers go out without a handgun. And when I explained to them that, uh, you know, there's, there's not any police officer in the country of the United States that goes out without a, without a gun, uh, and typically more than one um, as, as a backup, they were just baffled that, that on, on the stark difference. But obviously, when you compare the rules of each country, uh, looking at the number of guns that are owned in this country, the types of, of guns, the regulation or the lack thereof, I should say, within our country, and then compare it to, to Ireland. In Ireland, um, guns are used for hunting. And uh, you can own a, a, a shotgun, you can own a hunting rifle. Uh, you cannot own even a handgun there unless you get a specific permission and have a, a, a specific reason to own one. Um, and obviously, particular individuals for, for uh, 
you know, safety reasons that have to qualify to do that versus here in our country that, that you know, just a, a basic age regulation and, and um, you know, in certain places, um, right, there's no other regulations than that in places like California, where we try to push and, and ensure that there's people with the right mental capacity, uh, right, we, we require basic, uh, you know, a, a basic maybe uh, application. Um, but over there, it, it's very, very restrictive. And there are many, many types of guns that are that are simply just not allowed. And, um, and so they don't run into the gun violence that we do. And so their officers were baffled, which is how uh, frequent police officers here in our country will encounter incidents with firearms, encounter gun violence, how many people um, die, and, and whether it's police officers, obviously community members at the, at the, at the hand of a gun. And, and uh, it was really just a, such a, uh, an eye-opening experience for me to have a conversation with a fellow police officer in another country and, and, and uh, go back and forth on just some of the realities of, of, um, of what each of our respective countries faces, uh, specifically when it comes to, to guns themselves. And uh, I think that, you know, it, it, all that has done is solidify just what I've known since I was younger that, um, you know, this is obviously, these are, are, are tools, they're weapons, um, whether you've used them like I did for whether it was hunting or for sport, but they're, they are dangerous pieces of equipment that uh, need to be regulated uh, and, and, and need to be done so in, in, in ways where we ensure um, both the rights of individuals indeed, but the safety of the entire community. And as a, someone that enjoys uh, guns and enjoys owning them and owns them, um, I am completely in, in favor of, of these, um, these logical uh, regulations that, that we look to, to continue to to uh, impose on on this industry and so I, I again I appreciate the work from our city attorney's office I know this was not uh, easy to try and thread the needle to see where we had opportunity here um, but when you look at the the lack of success that we've seen in our federal government um, I think the only hope that, that we have in this country is that uh, at a local level, we will we will be able to 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 help um, and, and push up policy uh, that that can make its way up. Uh, and as we see more recently, and even here in the state, that that even that in itself, right, is going to continue to be uh, a challenge over the years. So, uh, but but thank you again to our city attorney's team and uh, and, and the mayor, and and I will uh, happily be supporting this. Thanks. Thank you, council member. Uh, Council Member Foley, just want to announce for the benefit of everyone, we're, we have 12 minutes left. We have three items. I'm told they cannot uh, be pushed over to subsequent weeks for reasons Dave can explain if anyone has questions. So I'm going to ask folks for a brief uh, extension of our curfew so we can get our work done tonight. Uh, in the meantime, we can all help ourselves by, <laughs> by voting quickly. Uh, Council Member Foley? <laughs> Mayor, do you need a motion for that? Uh, can I, I just finish? We will. Yeah, we, we will. No, Councilmember Foley, we'll absolutely go to you in just a moment. Uh, Councilmember Sparza, would you be willing to make a motion to, to extend the curfew? Uh, Councilmember Sparza, you're, you're muted. 1230? Do you need one for 1230? Yeah, that would, that would be fine. Hopefully that will take care of things. Okay, Second. I move to extend to 1230. Thank you. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Um, let's vote on this motion. Mendez? Yeah. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Cohen? Uh, I. Carrasco? Yes. Davis? No. Barza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? No. Mahan? Aye. Jones? No. Licardo? Aye. Okay, we've all heard it. The uh, result to keep going forward is weakening, so we should probably all do our best to get it done in the next uh, 40 minutes. Uh, Councilmember Foley? 
Yeah, I just have a couple questions. I won't take more than a couple of minutes. I had a question, uh, Lieutenant Kidwell, you mentioned briefly how many gun dealers we had. Could you give me those numbers again? Because it, it didn't sound like a huge number. Uh, there's eight retail gun dealers. Okay. And there's no added cost to them. It's part of the annual inspection that you would be making anyway. Is that correct? For permit so there's fees. there's no increased financial burden to them as far as the inspection. Correct. As far as training is concerned, who's responsible for training their staff or providing the training they need to train their staff? They are. Okay, will you provide them or will someone be providing them with a template or instructions on the best uh, training methods or training uh, procedures? Yes, the, the training is regard to the, uh, Rob. the straw purchase and the questions to ask, and we will be providing that. Okay, great. And then one final question, uh, because uh, all my other questions were answered, thank you, uh, is related to gun shows. I remember pre-pandemic, I used to see signs for gun shows. Does this ordinance, how would that impact gun shows or, re or vendors at gun shows? Uh, if that falls under a state exception, then that is written into that muni code and related to that, but we could uh, check on that. Okay, great. It, li like everyone else, I have heard uh, objections from some of my community. Mostly it's around the insurance uh, component, which is not part of this uh, at all. So I'm, I'm happy to see that. Uh, and then also about the privacy and the retention, but the retention isn't really any longer than you can keep your, your own personal camera work, uh, your security camera information at home. So I'm happy to support this as well. And with that, I'm finished and I will call for the question. Thank you, Councilman Foley. And uh, I do want to thank Lieutenant Kidwell uh, for your work on this, obviously very extensive and appreciate uh, the work uh, from you and, and the rest of the department. Uh, and I also want to thank Sarah Muntoff, who I spoke, I think you all heard her, uh, who has been a, an incredible advocate uh, for sensible gun reform, uh, and who has experienced obviously horrible loss in her own family as a result of gun violence. Okay, uh, let's vote on the motion. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, item 6.1 is a public hearing and resolution approving San Jose Muni Water System Urban Water Management Plan and Water Shortage Contingency Plan. There are two public hearings here, one on the Water Shortage Contingency Plan, the other on the Water Management Plan. These hearings are held under Water Code Section 10642 uh, and following sections. We are going to combine these public hearings, so please make sure if you are a member of the public would like to speak, you can comment on either plan. Uh, please comment by clicking the raise your hand link at the bottom of the screen. Um, the public hearing on both the water shortage contingency plan and the urban water management plan for San Jose Muni water system is now open. Public hearing provides an opportunity for the, any interested person to provide input on these plans. So we look forward to hearing your comments, but only on this, on these two subjects. Uh, thank you, Mr. Soto. Uh, thank you for that clarification, Mayor. This has been an extremely enlightening and interesting conversation. So uh, thank you for that. That's why I participate. Um, I think we we kind of like uh, came to a point where we understood that there's an impasse, especially with respect to just water issues earlier today. And so um, I personally... Uh, would really appreciate having a representative of the people, which is that is who our elected officials are, to be in the room to ensure that the people's business in the um, the uh, impact of all these policy changes 
is in the best interest of the person least able to advocate for himself. It is to him that we give our advocacy, not the one that's got the money. Thank you, uh, Brian. Thank you, it's very important. Um, I, I just mean more the line, I appreciate what the city does uh, for issuing with the, with the water. The water district, I don't feel that way. The water district, um, it, I just, you can't talk at the meetings. You get lectured and told basically you're an idiot and it really does cut off um, discussion. So I appreciate that aspect of this. And hopefully someday they will take a more enlightened view on how to have public discourse such as what you offer. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Roland? Roland, we're not able to hear you right now. If you're trying to speak, you're muted, I, I'm guessing. I, I, apologies, Mayor. You know, we, we are between the rock and the hard place right now. So, so what are we gonna do? They say, well, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, motion, vote unanimously, next, next item. But the question is, is we knew years ago that eventually we were gonna get here and we did nothing about it. And, and my question is very simple. What are we going to do to make sure that this never ever happens in the future? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Blair. Hi, thank you. Um, where applicable, uh, to again remind, I hope it can be easier for us uh, as an entire community to talk about the, the subsidy process and how uh, we can feel comfortable with the subject. And uh, I guess that's about all, it, how it can be easier to talk about for all of us, uh, for, for everyday community to feel more comfortable and for uh, local government to feel more comfortable to explain how subsidies work uh, that can help. Thanks. Thank you. All right, returning to you, Council. Uh, that is the conclusion of our public hearing. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your comments. Uh, the public hearing on both of these items is now closed. Councilor Sparza. Move approval. Second. second. It's a motion and a second. Are there any comments or questions? Let's vote. Menes? Yes. Prowlis? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. Item 6.2 are actions related to power procurement. I believe Lori. <coughs> Uh, has endured. This yeah, Mayor, if, in the interest of time, we can skip the presentation. All right, thank you, Lori. Uh, let's go to the public to see if there are any questions on actions related to power procurement. Mr. Soto. I appreciate how you give, you're very generous with your time with you know other people and not giving out that, that presentation, but yet we only get one minute to speak on these items. Um, with regard to this item, the, the, the infrastructure for power and electricity is going to increase exponentially over the next 10 years. The infrastructure that we have now, we're going to need cadmium and cobalt to supply the batteries. That's a natural resource, which means that this country is going to start going and creating wars in other countries in order to secure a steady supply of those resources. Okay, this we need to be mindful of when we're talking and putting a moral veneer on, oh, we're doing clean energy and we need clean energy and we need clean energy. We're going to start wars because what, those, uh, what the clean energy runs on is the batteries inside the cars that are going to be used for transportation. Thank you, Blair. Hi. To quickly add to what Paul just said, uh, workers are going to be exploited around the world to mine those uh, certain uh, minerals also. Um, to try as everyday public to offer uh, what I think Lori Metcalf would want to try to talk about, but I'm going to get this way wrong. 
you know, we're at a time to talk about the future of renewable ideas and how the subsidy process in San Jose can really help that process along. And I hope we can just learn how to talk about the subsidy process and, and make it a safe conversation to work toward renewable ideas like East Bay Community Energy is trying to do. They're going through the same thing. They have a great initial idea where they're bringing everybody into a renewable package for their future that's under subsidy ideas. They just don't quite know how to invite everybody to it yet. Why can't we do that here? Let's be open. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Roland? Thank you, Mayor. So first of all, to set the record straight, as far as I can tell, members of the public are getting three times as much time as anybody else so far. So I just thought I'd put that out there. The, the only comment I have here is that I, I really appreciate that uh, having an energy energy choice, what I'm looking forward is to having a water choice. Thank you. Thank you. All right, returning to the council, Councilmember Cohen. Yeah, I'm gonna try to be brief since uh, Sergio's audio sounds a lot like we all feel. So um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm gonna try to, try to ask my questions quickly. Um, I appreciate this item coming forward. I have a, I had a memo, which maybe you didn't see because it came out last minute right before the council meeting today, um, asking for some follow-up on, um, on how we can make sure we have some labor standards in some of our agreements um, and wanted to have a report back to t and &E committee uh, sometime later this year, I didn't give a time, any specific date, date there. Um, I know that the um, Peninsula Clean Energy has some additional labor protection for the con power procurement contracts that we sign, and I wanted to make sure that we, um, you know, learn more about how feasible that is for us and what that would mean for some of the contracts that we, that we go out for. Um, I don't necessarily, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that, um, but I would, the motion I'm gonna make is to accept the staff report and, uh, and number two on my memo, um, which is to bring that report, a report on that issue back to the TNE committee. Second. Second. Motion and second. Um, Lori, did you wanna comment if there are any obstacles in providing that data? Uh, no, um, I, I did have an opportunity to read your memo and, um, you know, I think we can certainly come back with a report just to let you know, um, you know, very supportive of, you know, worker and, and wage protections in the renewable contracts that we've executed to date. They do include prevailing wage and union labor, and in some cases, a project labor agreement. And importantly, we've also negotiated a significant amount of community investment funds from our long-term contracts. And, um, you know, to date, those total just under a million dollars that are coming here to San Jose. So, Happy to provide more details on that to t and &E, and thanks for your memo. Okay, thank you. Um, just one other question kind of on the side of that. Um, when, when we go out for these contracts, we're, we're, we're pretty much procuring con uh, clean energy from sources that are kind of already out there, right? Are, we're not, we're, my, one of my questions has always been, are we leading, is our use of clean energy leading to the building of more clean energy sources, or are we taking existing clean energy sources that could be used elsewhere? Because the ultimate goal is for more to be built so that all jurisdictions will have to end up using clean energy at some point. So, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we are doing both. Um, so we have both you know, procured renewable energy from existing supplies. We did more of that in the early years. And we have executed long-term power purchase agreements, which lead to the construction of new solar and wind projects. So happy to provide you more details on that. Um, but, but the answer is both. And, and we share your, your goal of building more new renewable supplies to serve our load. Great, I appreciate that. I look forward to setting up a meeting with you to talk about it in more detail since it's a late hour now. But um, yeah. so that's the end of my questions. Sure. Thank you, council members. Any other questions or comments? All right, let's vote on Councilmember Cohen's motion. Mendez? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Cohen? Cohen? Sorry, I pushed the wrong button. <laughs> Hi. Crosco? Hi. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. 
Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, for the final act of the night, 8.1 is a summary vacation, and boy, does that word vacation sound good right now. Summary vacation of a portion of Moore Park Avenue along the 1710 Moore Park Avenue frontage. Move approval. Second. Shakespeare, but there is a motion. Uh, is there any public comment on this summary vacation of Moore Park Avenue? Mr. Soto? Uh, yes, Mayor, unless I'm reading it incorrectly, does vacation have another uh, definition than the uh, commonly used? Uh, it's a question. I, I, does the word vacation have another word within this context, another meaning than what is ordinarily used? Mr. Soto, this is just I'm, time I'm, for I was, your well, No, I, I, I understand that, Mayor. I guess what I was extending was a, a request for a courtesy, and uh, it was met with silence. And so, uh, as disappointing as that is, um, I have nothing further to say. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're returning to council then. <clears throat> is there any comment, Councilmember Peralta? Yes, um, actually, just briefly, uh, it's actually was nice to, to hear Paul Soto join us back again. And um, I'll ask if uh, staff doesn't mind just giving a very, very short definition of, of what an actual summary uh, vacation is in this sense. Yeah, if I could, Councilmember, I think I'll do it. Thank um, you. Since I have the most history with this stuff. So um, vacation, you know, it's a legal term. We're abandoning a piece of right of way. You can do a summary vacation uh, under the code if that right of way has not been used for a certain purpose for a certain amount of years. So, in essence, uh, the provisions of the code allow us to do a summary vacation or a summary abandonment of a piece of right of way. Thank you. And I could understand why, you know, the, the, the typical understanding of vacation is not going to be uh, one of our constituents' understanding of, of this in this term. Uh, an abandonment is maybe a little bit better but it is indeed the terminology that we use. Thank you very much for, for uh, providing that explanation. And uh, I think we have a motion, if not, I'll move approval. Thank you for providing the motion. Second. second. I thought we had a motion already. We already have a motion and a second. Oh, yes, we did. Thank yeah. you. Forgive me, the hour's late. Uh, let's vote on the prior motion. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Crosco? Crosco? Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Going back to Crosco? Marking absent. All right, thank you. All right, uh, the agenda is concluded. We're on to open forum. Are any members of the public would like to speak on an item that is not on the agenda? Brian? Yes, I would like to say thank you to the emergency services. There was a gentleman um, by the 7-Eleven that I frequent. Now, I shouldn't go to 7-Eleven to lunch because I'm gaining weight. But um, he was passed out. I was very apprehensive about helping because you just never know. And, I'm trying to overcome that cowardice on my part, but I don't know about getting involved. Anyways, I called 311. They were able to call the, because he was passed out right by the VTA um, bus route there on Fruitdale, and um, they got help for him. I, don't, I hope he's okay. He, I used to jump right into that stuff. And sometimes I'm sort of ashamed of myself, but it, as things have gotten in the world now. Anyways, it worked, and I was very happy about that. Thank you, and have a great day. Thank you, uh, Paul. Yeah, Paul Soto. Um, I got. I have to really be honest. I, I, my feelings were hurt. I mean, I, I can't believe how hurt I'm feeling right now. But uh, yeah, it feels like rejection. But um, by a city that 
did harm to me bad. And I've given literally my all to this city. And if I request a courtesy in the future and, and respectfully submit it, I would, I would just ask, because I'm a kind of a sensitive person, that it be met with, with the, if, if the council could please put its personal feelings aside, but you can't because you made them known. Uh, Roland? Thank you, Mayor and Council Social Service at this uh, uh, late hour. Um, three quick comments about last yeah. night's uh, Charter, Charter Commission. Uh, first of all, a uh, huge uh, shout out to the uh, uh, City Attorney's Office uh, providing a really helpful uh, clarification on the final point of the Ground Act. Um, the next thing is, I think it was unfortunately to hold the Charter Commission at the exact same time as the um, uh, extended uh, final hearing on, on the budget. And to be honest with you, I was really interested in listening to the concerns of the city's employees and learning more about the situation. So the Charter Commission um, ha had to wait and I watched it uh, later. Um, now, with regards to outreach, I have a serious concern there because what they're doing, they're going basically out to um, the CBLs. They're basically reaching out to half of a percent of the population. In the city of San Jose, we had something called the Neighborhood Leadership Council and then off to the Neighborhood Association. Thank you. Thank you. Blair? All right, thank you. Thanks for the meeting today. I learned a lot. Uh, nice to hear Paul's back. Uh, nice question, him, question from him at the end and nice of uh, Councilperson Perales to offer a, a few ideas of what the terms can be. Um, with 45 seconds, um, what was important? Uh, what, what's important that I needed to, to consider for this meeting? Uh, oh, the East Bay uh, Community Energy is still working. Uh, they're redoubling their efforts to, to talk about subsidies and how it can uh, be talked about with lower income people for good renewable energy ideas in their future. They're making uh, new efforts to do that. Uh, I hope you know that you can, uh, take down uh, the wage of uh, new wages for police by 0.25% uh, and raise the city staff raise uh, wage by 0.25%. And with five seconds left, really work on open public policy and accountability for the Richard Messer T uh, public oversight. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes our public uh, forum at this time. Uh, meetings adjourned. Thank you everyone for hanging in there through, this, through the very end.